Hi there and welcome to the latest episode of the podcast and we're returning to the original format with this one. We're back to a, 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 an interview, a one-to-one interview with a quite an amazing character, Mark Sutherland, who I'll introduce in a minute. Mark um, came into the, the podcast, the 10-minute moons that we've been doing. We started chatting. We had one phone call for about 45 minutes to an hour the other night and in that conversation I just could see this amazing character with an amazing backstory and I thought he'd be a fantastic guest. So he's on the, the show today. This show's been sponsored by G51, who have been great to help us with the production course of this podcast and we're doing some interesting things with G51 going forward. So stay tuned and uh, hope you enjoy the show. So Mark, um, welcome to the podcast. Um, it's great to have you, um, and thanks for coming. Because uh, without guests, it's a bit lonely in here. I'm sitting <laughs> in the house myself, uh, uh, recording a, a podcast. I'm on. So uh, thanks for coming in. Could you tell the the viewers just who you are, where you're from, but your backstory? I mean, I know you're an interesting character from the, the the time you spent on the phone the other night, and it just I'm like, how do you go from that to that to that? So could you just tell us a bit about who you are? You know, where you were born, and maybe a wee bit of chronological order about your so that's very it's very kind i won't miss an opportunity to tell people about myself but it's very kind craig and thank you so much for inviting me in here and it's lovely to sit here and meet you so with my accent i am not from around here mm -hmm. i think the immediate thing to say so i am i'm from london mm -hmm. originally um there's a number of different things i've done from being an apprentice cabinet maker i'm a carpenter by trade furniture maker as well and then i ended up in teaching teaching uh, in high school from 11 to 18. Um, my last teaching job within mainstream teaching was working for a special unit where kids have been expelled mm -hmm. from school, which is uh, an interesting, an interesting uh, thing in itself. But going back a bit, I'd had previous experience as a youth worker in East London when I was uh, doing an OND and an HND in furniture making. And, oh, this is very odd when you start going through your CV, Craig. <laughs> very, very odd. And you want, and you work out this journey. So, yeah, so I, I ended up, um, I was uh, working self-employed, carpenter. I ended up in teaching, taught for a, a number of years. And what subject were you teaching? I taught what we would now call design technology. Yeah. I the C sadly have been dropped, which is craft design technology. So you are then teaching young people uh, metalwork, woodwork, plastic, um, and a subject that we may remember of of home economics and home economics. Where within schools, not I was not necessarily teaching that, but it encompasses that that whole subject. And home economics is a very expensive subject, part of the subject for schools to have because you've got to have ovens and all this kind of thing. And then this whole push to, well, let's, do we have to have this in a workshop? Do we have to have this set up? Becomes expensive. So then more of a push towards doing graphics, computers, et cetera, that whole thing. Um, where I passionately believe in wanting young people to come in and learn how to use basic tools because this whole thing of learning and we we got into it when the national curriculum was brought in i think 1988 where there's a whole standardization you and i both know that we all learn in different ways and then suddenly we've seen this one size fits all and then it becomes a load of tick boxing and not allowing staff etc to go to work out okay we're teaching a syllabus, we're going in a particular direction, but I actually want to be able to bring this into the classroom. So I, um, all right, we'll go down this little avenue. I used to be quite subversive in many ways. I used to have my own uh, class, you know, you were a form tutor and all the rest, and then you would have to do um, uh, a certain particular group, a uh, class that allowed you to what was it called? Social education or something? I can't quite remember. But I would then um, 
take certain television programs and educate educate my my form about certain things that were going on and i'm trying to think of the comedian beginning with mark and he ended up there was a television show he did and one show he did where we got this private school to go and sell uh, military hardware and stuff like this and and it was a private girls school it was really classic and it was a, a wonderful program but the reason why i'm saying it is that I work hard to broaden education. Then because of my um, interest in building scenery, theatre, which I then went on to do, our school plays went from the school hall to then having a purpose-built scaffold theatre <laughs> stage built outside in the grounds of this girls' school that the boys' school was doing this play with. So we did the Forbidden Planet, and I had a Greco generators on site and all this. Of course, the Greco is based up here. Um, so you expanded there, and then um, I ended up going in. We ended up going into the Fairfield Hall in Croydon because it was in the Croydon area in London. I'll just say that. And then uh, walking in, saying, "Right, can you hang this on bar this, bar that, bar that." And then you were looking at ways I got I got that particular play sponsored, you know, with the kids we've built enough scenery to build us fill a seven and a half ton truck and all this. So you worked hard to think outside the box, which I think is something that you personally do and you can identify. So you work hard to do stuff like that. And then, you know, I'm proud of the fact that one one particular one student who is still a friend of mine, you know, you'd had an influence on on his career and stuff like that. Sorry, Brian. So which set of years are we talking here, Mark? Um, oh my goodness me. I I left I left teaching in two thousand and three. Um I I got attacked <clears throat> I got attacked. Wow. And this this we're going to I think it's important we're going to this controversial area because I would love to make a drama out of it. So I got a I got attacked by I legally restrained the pupil who then thought it was perfectly acceptable to start scribbling all over the walls and after warning him and then saying no give me this particular pen and then suddenly this child thinks it's perfectly acceptable to put his hands around your neck and you release him and then suddenly you're recused of assaulting him and then what happens you then let's just stay this as a statement you then discover that his roots, he's come from uh, Albania, there's no passport, and you wonder whether, is he 16? Is he above mm -hmm. 16? Because that issue then has come out. So with other, with other incidences. Yeah. So yeah, so I then left and then I went into television and film and never looked back. Yeah, which is, this is, you know, I'm going, how'd you join the dots from being school teacher to producing? movies right mm -hmm. that's just bizarre to mm -hmm. me and then if you've been a drama teacher mm -hmm. i can see the the, the, the dot uh, being joined but when we're a carpenter went into um tech as we usually mm -hmm. call it up here and the movies that to me is bizarre so <clears throat> did, did that happen through this the the building sets and then into, I, I mean how did that come about yeah so in 1992 i then i got this phone call mark we're doing a low budget film doing a low budget film with friends we need a carpenter could you come along and i ended up um it's called white angel you could look that up then uh i ended up building sets for that we basically were in this house right we were in one house in uxbridge in london and we shot this movie peter firth um was was in it who was in films like letter to brezhnev yeah. etc so i then did that and then i got credited with the production design and then it went into 35 cinemas up and down the country which is a bit mad and including of course in london and um and that gave me a real feel for something that i wanted to do and i could say that actually from 1987 i just felt called to then do that i just thought i want to get into this but you sensibly also must have other strings to your bow it's really important because the film industry can go up and down um and the re and just in the last year the whole of the industry because of the strikes in hollywood went off a cliff over here so i did that i then finished my uh, teacher training and then in and then in between various things if, if i had time i would then go and work on 
few other low budget films. Mm. At that time, friends of mine wrote the Gorilla's Guide to Filmmaking books. There's about three of them, I think. I then I'm in those, which is amazing. Um, and so that's how that you fell into that. So I ended up. Uh, so we did White Angel, and then a few years later did um, another film called Urban Ghost Story. So we went into Ealing Film Studios, which of course is very famous for all the Ealing comedies. And then I oversaw building building a set there, uh, slightly un, unconventional. But again, working with people that, it's controversial say for the film industry, some, you know, unskilled, but it, because you're teaching experience doing various things you then organize that so urban ghost story was then made as a feature film um and that really began to give me a real taste so did that and then i did another movie called boston kick out etc etc we're still teaching so in 2003 when um that incident happened I then was asked to do a project where I was able to combine my passion for film and a passion for education. So in 2003, I did a short film called Pucker. And leading up to that, I'd spent three months using filmmaking as a way to teach English and maths, basically to kids off the street. So we ended up in a council estate in Stevenage. And as you... Then in the middle of the estate, there was a number of, of units. So there'd be shops there, et cetera, but a number of empty units that we took over. So I then got the young people to build uh, a police station with me, build a hospital, um, then uh, another scene of a lounge scene and stuff like this. And then we had Nick Moran uh, turn up and he starred in that. And we got a number of the kids in it. And then we shot this film. But here's the amazing thing and something that I know is passionate, you know, very passionate to you. The crime rate, crime rate on this estate lowered by 18% while we were there and the police measured certain figures because we were engaging, engaging young people. Plus we were there, there was a presence there. So that was quite amazing. We won a community award from Notting Hill Film Festival because of that. Now we... Myself and with other people at the time, particularly the writer who's sadly no longer with us, which is a gentleman, old friend called Mark Straker. So he wrote Pucker. He then went on to write other stuff. So we then made two other films, but we involved school and education because funding anything like that, any movie, is very, very difficult. It is difficult. You've got to cleverly, if you've got no money, you've got to cleverly look at how you can do it. And then, of course, if you're going down a line where you are what we would call combining public money, the outcomes have got to be beneficial for that. So um, we then, uh, we then, it's funny, they're my films, and I can't even, I'm forgetting the, the film titles. But um, we made Pucker. We then, uh, we then another shot another short film uh, about basket, uh, basketball that went on in 2006 to win Best Drama in the very short film uh, festival uh, in, uh, in LA. Um, and I will try and think of the film, so embarrassing. But then we went on to do another project as well. So that, I was either executive producer, co-producer or whatever on, on these, and then raising money in certain certain cases particularly with Pucker. So that gave me a real feel for that and thinking, well, this is a really important communication tool. Yes, there is a lockout, you could say, within film and TV. It's how you come at it. It's the usual thing of who you know and all the rest. But at the end of the day, when we use that phrase, yeah, um, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But the issue is you still have to deliver because whoever's enabled you to get into that position the last thing you want to do is is let them down um so that in a nutshell is how i then fell into it and then worked out a way that you were always drawing on your teaching skills and how you then uh motivate 
motivate young people, how you can interact with people. And those, those skills are, you know, you use them now in, in, in the workplace when those, jobs, uh, when those jobs avail themselves. Told you it's an incredible story. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the interesting thing, and that's what I, I like to do. Even, you know, a lot of my guests are being people I have known a lot about. Can I can I just say can I just say that I want to I want to publicly pay pay you a compliment okay. because I, I don't need to deal with that too uh, well. To be well, well, well I, I want to do that. I mean, you very kindly sent me your interview with Paul Murray, and I feel honoured to sit here in his seat. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you. Because the information that's coming out, and that's why, as we've said, this whole communication, being able to tell our story, is so important. It's so important for our mental health, but. Thank you, because it was excellent. I appreciate that. And as someone who's not a, a Rangers fan, he sat and watched that when the subject matter, the majority of the subject matter is probably not on your um, high on your agenda, then fair play. I appreciate that. I do, I do really. So you, your story, you, um, fascinating in that we're probably just up to maybe 10 years ago. But did, did you, you said that you made a movie about basketball. Yes. Is that the one that won an award in America? Yes, it did. It did. So that just blows my head. Right. I, th I think it was this filmed in London. Um, it was filmed uh, in the Stevenage area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what happens is um, at that time, short films were a precursor as a as a pitch to say that you could make a full length feature film of ninety minutes. So I mean, the last uh, short film I I produced two thousand eighteen, a long time ago. Um, is is 22 minutes long so you then times that by four so to speak and there you are you've got your feature film um yes that the the basketball was yeah that that to me is like uh snowy eskimos isn't it it's to it taking a, a movie about a traditionally american sport and winning mm -hmm. an award in mm -hmm. america is just fantastic so is that the whole <clears throat> as somebody who's not I'm a film buff. I mean, I enjoy movies like mm. every other normal mm. person, and I've got my favourites and, and stuff like that, but I'm not in any way a film buff. So is that the, the, the sort of main reason for short films? Is that why they're a thing in the first place? It's more of a sales pitch to look at what we can do and we can en enlarge this story and bring in some more characters and give you a, a, a proper movie. I would say absolutely, because it proves that you can do it. I mean, in 2000... Um, it's very interesting when someone asks you to talk about yourself, and it's it's quite fascinating having this experience yeah. right now. But in 2014, I found there was the um, uh, sci-fi movie festival, and there was about three or four item, four films in there that I had either worked on or part in different roles. So um, we, 2013-14, I then made co-produced what's called Abe the Movie about Navarius Robot on YouTube. It hit over a million hits and all this kind of thing. Um, so it's about 10, 11 minutes. It's not something to watch late at night, but it's a, it's a fantastic film, I would say that, I suppose. So in it was the clever Gollum-esque technology where someone comes in dressed in a suit with all the different notes on, and then you can match that in regard to the technology in the computer and then paint the human out and then create this robot and the robot in abe the movie you could see that aba on youtube now i mean there's a big uh it's shown shown on a, a platform called dust and stuff like that so in the london sci-fi film festival abe was in there and then we entered with friends we entered the 48 hour film festival where you make a film in 48 hours and we made um uh, always the sun there. There was another film called Mouse and I'd built the set for that. So I am that frustrated producer and you understand how that works. And maybe I'm the only, only producer in the country that knows how to use a cherry picker and have a cherry picker <laughs> license. Um, I'm proud of that. That's partly because I've then, I've then done prop, you know, work in the prop department. To, we can go on to that and say recently. Um, but that that is one of the incredible things. You're right in regard to short films. It then proves you could do it. You, you've done that. Um, and then in 2000, we use this phrase. People use this phrase within a movement where some people call it the truth of movement for argument's sake, where you wake, you wake up 
you wake up and you view, you start to view the world very differently. I'd always been interested in politics. I'd always been interested in what's going on. So in 2010, I, I began to wake up to certain things. And then in 2015, um, I, there was a film competition I entered. Uh, someone else entered it. I didn't win. They didn't win, but they got into the last three. And it seems as though that we were make, trying to make a film along the same lines. So the Bible Society, God, you never thought I'd actually say that in one of your wonderful podcasts, but the Bible Society runs a film festival short film festival, um, or it did then, where they ask you to take a story from the Bible and turn it into a short film. So I then looked to the book of Daniel because it's about speaking truth to power, which is something very close to my heart. Anyway, cut a long story short, I ended up out of that producing a short film called Between Lambs and Lions. And by this time, I had woken up to American politics and what was going on. That became a huge interest of mine and still is. And I have a lot of contacts over there. So I then made Between Two Lambs and Lions, which was a short film where I stood up on my own as a producer. So I then worked out, right, okay, where can I get these locations for nothing? When, when we make films or creative projects like that, and it's something that I'm sure I know you can identify, you look at what you've got in your hands and you look at who you know and you start to add this up. But the most important thing is you're not exploiting that. You're asking people to come on a journey and come with you. And the most important thing is to finish that journey and to finish this product. So we made Between Lambs and Lions, um, which takes the book of Daniel in, in the Bible and set it amongst the political machinations of Washington politics. I was awake to what was coming in 2016 in regard to the presidential election, Hillary Clinton v. Trump. You began to look at certain aspects of the history, political history of America, and how it's put over. And yes, there is a deep state. And yes, there is a shadow government. We have the same. That could be come up in as we continue to talk and how how that's viewed so i made that and then that started like a little rocket on youtube and then got censored which is rather interesting by who what would happen on the youtube counts as you as you know yeah as you're fully aware is that you see your counts of the hits go up and then it reached something like 20,000, and then they chopped 2,000 off it, and then slowed it down where you would get a hit a day. And I would find this hilarious because it has been screened. It's been, I know, I know a lot more people. Uh, that sounds a bit boastful. I don't mean it in that way, but I know a lot more people have seen it. But then again, I am not, it's not, un now, it's not unknown for me to then be censored on social media. So I made that. And um, very, I'm very, very proud of that film because, and I don't want to be right. I have to say this to you. It's painful. Mm. You see things in a different way and then they unfold. When people talk about conspiracy and cons conspiracy theory, you, which was a term invented when JFK was shot, that anyone that questioned John F. Kennedy shooting and uh, they did not, they then walked, they were then outside the narrative that was pushed at, at that time via CIA, CIA, Dulles and Lyndon B. Johnson and all the rest, then you would then they would say, oh well you're a conspiracy theorist. Well this is interesting because conspiracy has gone from 40 years to about six minutes. Mm. I don't say that to go, oh look at me. Because it's very painful to say. Because when you in conversations with friends when you warn them about something please don't do that. And then they do it and they go, ah, you were talking about that. Yes. I'm not some, I'm not a prophet and I'm not a sage. I just read a lot. And then you gather, you gather this information. So that's, that's why I made between, I felt led to make between lambs and lions. And yes, I would love to make that into a feature film. Yes. There's been even discussions with people to do that. 
Um, but it's like, quickly going back, it's like with Abe, the movie, uh, my then friend, Rob McKellen, got on a plane, went to see uh, MGM, went to see Sony, because they were interested. And then that all died a death. But we had to go. And we will continue to have a go. And we're not going to, and we're not going to stop. Yeah, I've watched the movie, the, you, you know, the, um, you've just been talking about the Book of Daniel movie that you've done. And it's not that controversial um, on the face of it. Mm. And I would suggest there's probably far more controversial things on YouTube just now. Um, so why does that get censored and by who and how does it actually work <clears throat> well i think the whole the whole censoring in regard to uh youtube other channels is now more blatant and more out there so how would you do it you would then hide it you would then shadow shadow ban it um you would then take the hits off um no it's very kind of you to say that because in many ways i don't think it's controversial I mean, when you're turning around and going, you know, endless war rage, money was manipulated until it meant nothing. I think that's a truth. So that truth is something that people then don't don't want to hear. I mean, you are aware of the phrase, the military industrial complex. Um, we look at when Eisenhower then gave a warning as he was leaving the presidency because JFK had won. And then he makes his very famous speech when he's warning about the military industrial complex. What's very interesting and is very relevant now is that uh, he left out one word. He was told to leave out one word, which was the military industrial congressional complex. And he is then making a link to Congress, to the political system and how people benefit out of deals and how they benefit out of making money out of weapons, military, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and e.g. endless wars range, how we have wars, how we start wars. It's a huge subject, but it's very, very important and it's very, very in, uh, important now. And the reason why in, in between lambs and lions, you know, you've got, you've got this thing where the constitution has been suspended. There's complete, utter power abuse by the executive office, which is uh, the president of the United States. And I would then say that is what is happening now. And the whole, the whole parallel there of Jan 6, uh, which I had the privilege with a very close friend of mine, David Summerall from stophate.com, to then be supporting that. Um, and there's a book that's come out that's out called the American Gulag Chronicles, which is to raise money for the prisoners, for people that have been arrested, for standing on the grass or for being there at January 6th to um, quite rightly under the constitution to then go and exercise their constitutional rights. And uh, as we now know, I'll just say, we segue slightly into this, as we know, because Between yeah. Lambs and Lions is a, in many ways, was like a precursor of certain things that unfolded um but on january the 6th the police started the violence that's now that's come out tucker colson talks about that my dear friend david has been on tucker colson talking about that there's three documentaries that he's made the last documentary that was released a few weeks ago um it then went to two million hits and then is shadow banned so in other words and we only have to if people if people watch the World Economic Forum, if they watch Davos, this is not conspiracy. This is not out there. It's all, all, it's all on. It's all on the internet. But it's then joining, joining the dots up. There are a group of people that do not have our best interests in mind, and they have a hidden agenda and a genocidal agenda. Well, we used to say it's hidden. It's now blatant. So my film was... I didn't realize that at the time, but was alluding to certain things that were coming down the pipe. Because in the film, you've then got, I'll give you another example, Craig. If you take Ron Paul, who was a big political, 
figure in America, who then ran for the presidency. And there he is. Um, he's running for the presidency. And then you've got people making comments from a news point of view going, uh, and Ron Paul is uh, what he's running for. Actually, he was third, and if not, in certain places, second. What I'm trying to illustrate is the manipulation of words and the manipulation of the media to then get what they want. So if you if you take the reason why, um, sorry, but segued into, a, I think, a very, very important subject, because in many ways, it, if, if I'm allowed to say that, and uh, David, if you're listening, that's one of the reasons that eventually, one of the reasons I made it, it's joining those dots up, like as a warning. So Jan, uh, Jan 6 was about people going along to exercise their constitutional rights, because as far as I'm concerned, there was fraudulent within the votes, and it, it was stopped. That's it. Then when you then create what's called a Fed insurrection, you've got the FBI there, etc. You're leading the charge to, to manipulate events. And now as, um, I mean, there were five deaths that day. People took a while to realize this. Um, so Ashley Babbitt, Benjamin Greeson, Kevin Phillips, Roseanne Boylan, and the fifth was a police officer called uh, Officer Signick. And he, if you take his death, he died because he was suffering either, I think, from a, a heart problem, something had come up. He was then taken by patriots to the police lines to say, could you look after him? You could then argue, I mean, someone from the patriot side from the J, from the people there on Jan Six, said, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I uh, have medical experience. Can I give medical aid?" Bloody blah, blah. And he was like, "No, we're 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 sorting him out." Officer Signick then died. He died, and then in the press, it's um, oh, he was killed by being hit with a fire extinguisher by a bunch of patriots that were there on uh, Jan Six. That was a lie, a total lie. And uh, sadly, he died, but they used his death, this whole thing of um, building this case for this insurrection, saying it's uh, the worst thing since, you know, we look at Pearl Harbor 9-11. I mean, it came out of Kamala Harris's mouth. Now, as it's there, the whole thing was a complete setup because the people were there to turn around and say, constitutionally, um, we are questioning the votes. We're questioning in regard to the Electoral College, and they should all go back to the states and recount those votes. Now, when you go back to media manipulation, Fox News, as much as people might think, it's very interesting because you know as well as I do, we sit within a paradigm of left wing and right wing where we could definitely say within the American system, and I think over here, we have a uni party. We have a uni party. So for argument's sake, in regard to Brexit, when you have got the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Scots Nats, the Welsh Nats, um, the parties in uh, you know, Sinn Féin, um, etc. All, all saying that we need to stay within the EU. I, I said it publicly. I then think I'm living in a communist state. What is the difference between all these parties? So the same within America. So Fox News called Arizona for Biden. Remember, um, of course, America has far more time zones than we do. So if a news channel calls a state on the West Coast before the East Coast doors have been locked for them to still be able to vote if there was an hour or so, then by creating that, what would happen is that you then put off people from going to actually vote. And they think, oh, well, we've lost this. When you see the fact that, and that they have done this for years, I mean, in 2016, whatever, whatever people think of Trump, right, 
uh, which that's still open. Whatever people think of him, the fact is that what he said he would do, he then worked on enacting. And no, he's not a politician. And just because he sends one or two tweets that are offensive, because he is not as silver-tongued as Obama, and Obama is another interesting, interesting question, because he, he then, you know, Trump was doing that, the votes, they were stolen. You then, the Democrats have a history of stuffing the votes. And as you know, with COVID, with the shutdown, it was then an opportunity to go, right, we can do ballot harvesting. We're going to leave boxes on the street. You're going to put, we can stuff them with votes. So it, when you then have a history of using, of using electronic means to count votes as well, as Stalin said, it's not who votes that's important, it's who counts the votes. And that is, not, that is, an, that is an, an issue. Postal voting is an issue. Personally, it should be a handwritten ballot on the day you go in and vote. And of course, if over here, people might turn around and say, yeah, but old people can't get out and all the rest. I, I hear that. There's a way around that. But postal voting is abused in this country and is abused, abused elsewhere. So within America, in 2006, a, a very interesting lady that I've had the privilege to interview called Vicky Carp oversaw a book, edited a book called um, Hat, and it goes in about the Diebold voting machines that were pre-Dominion voting machines, and it talks about how you can hack, hack these machines. So in other words, you would put your vote in, and it's been, I mean, there is YouTube links of this. You would put your vote in and go, I am voting Republican for argument's sake, and then it comes out Democrat. It's not, you know, this was filmed in doing this. So this abuse has been there for a long, long time. But well before that, even, even in the 60s, of how, um, I mean, the accusation is, is that Lyndon B. Johnson in 1954 in Texas, where he's becoming a senator, um, there was huge fraud within within that. So we're going back a heck of a long time. In fact, we could even go back to the Civil War, go back to Abraham Lincoln wanting to get rid of him as president. You've then got people um, gathering together to buy to buy votes. So there is a long, long history, and there's a very interesting man called Alexander Boot who wrote a book called, you know, Democracy, a Neocon. It's a neocon trick. It's a con trick. And of course, without us going down any controversial road, Craig, what, me? No, of course I wouldn't <laughs> do that. Um, the whole situation, and I know we're going all over the place, so thank you for that. But the whole thing of what's happened with the postal dreadful situation with the whole with the post office the horizon software for or the horizon thing and fujitsu and all the rest and that these poor people were accused of uh, stealing which they weren't doing and and uh, and eventually all this has come out and now we know that uh, politicians knew and etc cetera, etc cetera. whether anything is going to be done or we're going to hold these people to account is another issue but it's this whole thing of electronic and then we have to, Fujitsu has a lot of con government contracts. We have to go down the line to look at, we have e-voting e for councils. We have that in Scotland, e.g. in regard to calculating the votes. Those issues have to be looked at. Where any, any electronic voting around the world has to be looked at. I think in um, 2014, hope I've got this right, I think in Latvia, the whole thing was electronic. In the Philippines, I believe, in 2016, there were questions there that were verbally said. And it's not conspiracy. It is not conspiracy at all. You, you want to be able to go into the voting booth with a piece of paper and write that and say, that's it. And anything electronic can be abused and that is what was going on in 2020 in regard to the presidential election. I think, 
from my own personal point of view, I think <clears throat> the most basic form of polling is, is you take a piece of paper, you put it in a box and someone counts it. And as you said, it's not important who you vote for, it's who's counting the vote that, that, that dictates. And even in its more barbaric form of a piece of paper, a pencil and a, and a box, it is open to abuse. Yes. And you've just got to hope that the society that you're part of is trustworthy enough that that abuse is minimal. But when you make it electronic, it's making it less obvious who perpetrated the crime, as it were. So it's far easier to click a button on the other side of the world or the other side of the planet nowadays, probably from an iPhone to control any other electronic device that's connected to the internet, if you know how. That's far easier and less chance of being pointed out than somebody sitting at the Scottish Exhibition Centre pulling out a bag of, you know, votes for whatever party that, you know, is conspiring to defraud an election. That's far more difficult and far less likely, I would suggest, in, in you know, um, in Western European countries like that we are. But to hit a button in a computer totally anonymously is far easier to do and far more likely. And you would think that with the horrific um, situation with the rising post office debacle, surely as a society we see that and surely we can say, oh, hold on a minute. We can't just say, well, it's all right because we've paid these people, you know, uh, compensation, which is due. Some of them will never be enough. Some of them have, you know, jumped off bridges and oh, things awful, because of awful. situations around. But we can't just say, ah, it'll be all right now because we've sorted that or it's all right now because that was the Philippines or it's all right because that was Latvia. And in the modern society as well, in the westernised society, we've got to be a reproach. And if having electronic means for voting or counting votes gives you a 1% a, a, a chance of people pointing the finger, then surely you should be able to um, reject these notions. I mean, that that's sensible, is it not? It is extremely sensible, but you're asking, you're relying on people being honest. Mm -hmm. You're relying on people not having an ideology to undermine that and not to have an ideology where they believe in progressive collectivism and they believe in creating a one world government because that's the truth of it and i, I think you, you made a point and every day is a school day and um when you said that the, the word conspiracy came about um the gfk mm -hmm. murder and it's clever because there's certain words nowadays that you can just say oh. and that, that they're, they're what i would call argument ending words you say fascist you say right wing you say racist mm. you say conspiracy mm. you say you know all these things and they become argument in them yeah. that's it when, when somebody's pointed that at you yeah. you have no right in, in society yeah. to retort mm. that's it game's over absolutely so it's and i was actually considering this um the other week there i thought what, what did that because and i think i said to you in the phone call we had the other night a conspiracy is only a conspiracy until it becomes the truth but that, therefore, by pure default, means it was the truth all along. Because it doesn't just become the truth, it was the truth. Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that is why what you are, I think, helping to lead the charge on and with others as well is trying to expose that. You're saying, well, this politician said this at the time. And now, because of, like, the COVID inquiry, mm -hmm. we're now discovering that they decide not to keep certain uh, digital data or wipe it off their phones or whatever but you're rely you're relying on people's honesty you're relying on people to have the same approach to honesty that you do that the fact is and you raise that and you're absolutely right because the whole that's why we have to get rid of everything electro get rid of it electronically it is ab it is abused you know, um, and we've got to investigate that. But you, again, I come to it. You're relying on other people's honesty, where if we see that people come into politics, you know, what you and I were saying this the other night, what have they actually done uh, done before in life? What proper job have they done? Have they actually, have they actually struggled? Now, I may not uh, agree 
politically with a lot of stuff that Dennis Skinner says as the beast of bowls over sitting on the, on the, on the Labour Party benches. But I respected him. And the reason I respected him is because at one point he was a coal miner. Lee Anderson, who sits on the yeah. Conservative side, amazing guy, coal miner, Want, got into politics, rejected Labour, got into politics because he, he wanted to really make things happen for his community and where he, where he is, Genuine, genuinely. Very interesting because when, uh, when Trump won, uh, one politician in London, uh, in Westminster from Wales, I can't think of his name right now, said that Trump may go down as the only politician in history that will actually do what he says. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like that phrase, you know, it's what it says on the tin. Yeah, yeah. I think as an outsider, now my, 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 I think we spoke about this on the phone the other night. My, uh, I've always been politically aware, mm. but mm. my awareness of my politics and where I wanted to vote was purely up until recently, who I felt would A, serve me best in Westminster as a constitution, mm. as a constitution member, and B, who would probably be the biggest effect in my life. And that, you know, I've voted Labour, Tory and Liberal mm. Democrat in the, in the past. Um, and that was because I was not party led. I just, old fashioned and ridiculous as it may sound, I felt I was voting a man to go down to our women, to go down to Westminster and represent me. So whoever it was at that particular election would get my vote. But, I just, is it my, my, what do you call it, political awakening is, is very recent. Um, and it happened round about the introduction of the referendum um, in Scotland, uh, which happened in 2014. Now, between 2012 and 2015, I was kind of busy with other things in my life that we spoke about before we come on air. So that was taking up a lot of my thoughts and times mm -hmm. and energy. Mm -hmm. But I was aware, obviously, of the dependent referendum, and I became more particular about what was going on in politics. And a few people have had pops at me and say, oh, what about Westminster? But what about Westminster? I'm Scottish, happily British, and live in Scotland. So if I've got things to say about Holyrood and the politicians in control at Holyrood, that is more important to me right now than anything that goes on at Westminster. That's not to say I ignore it, but that's where my drive's got to be. And it's all... So what happened up here, we get totally polarised during the run-up to the referendum. Yeah. And it was, there was something unique that I had never came across as an adult before. And there was this God-given right for everybody else to know how you were voting. Now, before that, my vote was a relationship between me, a piece of paper, and a little box, yeah. a polling yeah. booth. Yeah. And that was it. Now, my father or my, 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 you know, when I was married, my wife or whatever might have asked me, how did you vote, by the way? But it was no bigger question than, is it raining outside? It was just a conversation. But from the referendum, the run-up to the referendum, I suddenly thought, well, hold on a minute. Why have you got to ask me how I'm voting? Now, I was quite public and, you know, it was quite obvious where I was voting when anybody had a conversation with me. But you were saying, you're voting yes or no? What the hell's it got to do with you? Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't know if this has been replicated over the world. You see in America, they seem to always had because of the two-party thing. There was always quite a polarisation mm. in politics. Mm. I'm, that's mm. not new to me. But certainly in, in Scotland, and I, and I, and I it's a, it's a fair, I dare say, probably across um, the rest of the UK. But the driver for that in Scotland was definitely the referendum. And then since then, the question never changed. Everybody must know where your politics, and everybody must pick a side, and everybody must be polarised. Now, I don't know, I'm not that clever, but was that by default or design? Because if it was by design, it's bloody clever. Well, it's it, it's extremely clever. And... Um... You're absolutely right. The polarisation. I mean, I I voted I voted to leave the EU. I can sit here for hours and explain why. Yeah. But I I then um, the polarisation is real. But you're allowed to express an opinion. You're allowed to fight for what you believe is right. And the EU, let's just say it, is a supranational uh, confederacy with 26 unelected commissioners. And everyone thinks, oh, we're, we're voting for our member of the Europe, European Parliament. When, uh, when we were taken in there, Ted Heath won the election 
in 1970. He's in the uh, in their manifesto in a small square. It says, "I'm going to take us into the uh, into the common market." I've actually sat in a room with people that voted to join the common market. So you were then joined with six other countries, five or six other countries, and it's this whole thing about having low a, able to have ease of trade. So you then have tariff barriers that are low and you work that out. In many ways, that makes that makes sense. But the whole plan was to create this supranational government, to create a, a federacy of countries like the U, like the United States, but it but without a, without a constitution. And as much as I am not going to quote the lines out of the out of the Hotel California, but it's you know. You, you enter, but you can't leave. If it wasn't for the Lisbon Agreement, then we could not have had the, the exit plan. So I read, I read the history of Europe and the Great Deception, and it is a great deception, because the whole idea is that over time, people will, will then lose control of their nations, and we create this huge confederacy, which is then 26 unelected commissioners telling us what to do. So the history of Europe and the Great Deception written by Richard North and Christopher Booker. Booker used to write for the Telegraph, sadly no longer with us. But had over time, both of them had made, began to observe what was happening in Europe and thinking uh, there are huge problems here. This is not democratic. And I then had the, I had the privilege to work with them. And in 2016, you could see the fact that on the 23rd of June, we were going to, I think it was 23rd of June, we were going to have um, this uh, referendum. Cameron then arrogantly thought he was going to win it. So we then had the referendum. It's very interesting that he's back, and that's another story which is very important to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so I then made Flexit the movie, the definitive guide of how the UK could leave the EU and protect its economy. And Richard North, who's had a lot of experience with uh, the whole EU debate for, for, for a number of years, um, is a real, a real expert on that. And um, he has his own, if people are interested, he has his own uh, blog called Turbulent Times, which is fascinating. Now, so I made that. But you're right, it became very, very polarised. I remember when, uh, sadly, Joe Cox's death and someone saying to me on Facebook, an MP has died, lay off, you know, posting what you're posting. Well, you know, I think 17,410,752 people with a majority of over a million voted out. That was it. It was a democratic decision. We accept the decision. Well, no, they didn't. And if we had lost, we would have accepted it. Now, it's this whole thing of whether we believe in nation states, and I personally believe that we are greater together. And I'll say this publicly. Scotland, and I have a heritage here because my surname is Sutherland. My great-grandfather came from here. It's an unbelievably incredible country. And you and I discussed this the other day, where the heritage of entrepreneurialism the heritage, and I understand it, that people have left uh, the winters at times here and gone, gone to other countries that are a lot warmer. But we look at the heritage and the people that have come from this country and the inventions and all the rest that have, that have been done, whether that bell, bed, for argument's sake, with television, there's always a controversy about that because the Americans say, well, we invented it first, bloody blah, blah. But this is really, really important. And that whole thing of entrepreneurialism, making things happen, enabling young people to make things happen. How can we get you from here to here? And when people throw the trope at us, and they have me on many occasions, oh, right wing. Well, what do they, do you actually, can you define it? What we're saying is small government, low taxes. We don't want to be interfered with. The government, the government has a responsibility for the security of the nation and, you know, whether that military, police, but to then create a situation where you're empowering people to make things happen. Because 
whatever whatever we say we need to be able to create things as a nation to sell to then get that income in and if we are creating a situation where we can't do that and i feel that that is what's going on now we're sliding into as uh, as it's like with the whole net zero thing and and uh, the daily uh, skeptic today has a fantastic article on that saying net zero you know we may be walking away from that but our economies are still going down the swanee and particularly in regard to the uk and germany so they throw that out but it's about independent it's about independence us standing up alone and i'm i don't make any apology for this but in 1973 as soon as we joined we lost control of our nation no matter what people think we did because over time incrementally and the fantastic television series um oh my goodness me it's yes minister yeah if people watch that now that's that's a documentary now that's not a parody any longer <laughs> Craig, well said. That's brilliant. Absolutely. Because, um, as a very close friend of mine explained, what you then have is what's called um, the ministerial code. And it's something that Blair brought in. And like you, I have voted all over the place. Voted all over the place. Because um, going, right, what would be best for our situation at this point? And I, you know, I've more than uh, prepared to sit here and publicly and say yes i voted for blair in 1997 i never did that again because you had had enough of conservative behavior at that time and we'd seen the brown envelopes with aiken and when he took i then met him but then he took the guardian to court he lost that case and then you you had other sit other situations going on um including you know John Major saying, let's get back to basics, but you seem to have more time with um, Edwina Curry, but that's when I'll go down that road. But there's all, all of this kind of thing going on. Um, and yes, Minister, the ministerial code that came in meant over time that, that, that MPs, ministers, had to behave in a particular way, which meant you were then reinforcing to me my opinion even more power to the civil service because they turn around and go well we're not happy with this person's behavior so we're going to start seeing if we can get him out and dominic Raab of recent is a real interesting case along those lines oh um he he's a bully he's criticized my work because i've missed out this paragraph or whatever so these people start to gang up so the ministerial code has been tightened and tightened and tightened. So yes, minister showed the fact that the minister gets in and thinks, right, I'm now running the department. I will now, these are the policies of our party. We are now going to say to the civil servants, this is what you want to implement. And then as you saw, you know, on that program, well, minister, we can't quite do that. I mean, the classic you know, one of the things, of course, it's close to my heart, but one of the classics is when they're when they're trying to decide the um, new Archbishop of Canterbury or whatever, and they're going, or new bishop, and they're suddenly saying, well, he's got to believe in God. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is, that, show, that shows the machinations, but it also shows the politics within the church, which is another interesting subject. But it shows that machination. And then, of course, now, now, where top civil servants like one particular one who then you know used to work in the un which is a six-hour conversation in itself in regard to the united nations and then sees they see themselves as politicians they see themselves as going well no if i don't agree with this policy i'm going to push i'm going to push back i'm going to say i'm gonna no i'm not having this like for argument's sake and a subject very close to my heart. So if you take what's happening um, in Israel at the moment and the awful pogrom on the 7th of October and Hamas doing the dreadful acts that they have done, the fact that within the Biden administration, you've got a bunch of youngsters there turning around and saying, well, we're gonna, who are working in the administration, we're gonna go on strike, we don't agree with 
your policy of sending uh, ships to to Israel. Now, there's a lot to unpack there in regard to American behavior now. But the fact that the way you're employed to do a job, you're employed to be part of this administration, you're employed to, you are, as the civil servant, to push through what, what, the, government, what the government says. And now we realize, and we definitely realize that with Brexit, that we've got people working against us. When you have a democratic decision, and that was what happened with over a million people. And as I come back to it, Craig, if we had lost that vote, we would have taken Stop it on the chin. You. We would have taken it on the chin. And I'm sure, and just quickly in regard to the independent vote of 2014, you're right in how that has led up to polarization, because I'm sure that you and I could sit here. I definitely, I'm sure you can, sadly, and also me, that people then stopped talking to you. People didn't want to talk to you anymore. And let's just remind people that in London, 40% of Londoners voted out. You wouldn't believe that, would you? No. With the way that Mayor Khan, et cetera, goes no, that, on. And that's just the way it's spun, though. Yes. But, you know, Facebook, right? Yeah. That you scroll about a third down and there's this big list of people that says people you may know mm. because it's people that you have as common friends mm. um, are on your friends list. Mm. I, I I can't go on to that without chortling because I go, you were my friend, you were my friend, you were my friend. No, I don't, I can't remember ever removing somebody that is still on Facebook. You know, sometimes I need him because you don't have 5,000 friends. So if someone sends me a friend's request and I happen to be at 5,000 that day, I need to delete somebody. And what I normally do is I go down and I look for a grey profile photo. You click on it and it said no longer on Facebook. Great, I can delete you mm. and fill up another one. Um, and, he, and you go, you were my friend. And 99.9%, I know for a fact, it's because of having a different opinion on the future of Scotland. Yeah. The other 0.1% is over football. Mm. But that's how bizarre it is. And I'm talking about people... Family friend, family members, mm -hmm. yeah. friends of since childhood, mm -hmm. um, and people who uh, you know maybe had um, really strong relationships with as an adult through work or other things, and they, they simply do not want. To. And I think this is another bizarre thing about social media. I actually thought the yes was going to win the Scottish referendum I hear you. Yeah. for two reasons. One, you seem to be a more volume on social media. And two, if you walked around the city centre, you would see loads of people with yes badges on. Mm. And here lies the problem. If these people do not want to be even anywhere near you in social media or in private um, anymore, then they are surrounding themselves with people who want the exact same as them. So they actually then believe, hold on a minute, everybody I know wants to vote yes. And then they wake up in the morning after the referendum and the vote was no, they start going, well, somebody must be cheating here. Because everybody I know voted yes. Well, that's right, because you've shut off every other single person. And the, the, the mad thing about the, the city centres was, if you were to have walked around Glasgow city centre on the run-up to that referendum with a union jack, you'd have got shouted in the street. Yeah. If you walked into anywhere with a yes badge on, nobody blanked an eyelid. And it, and it was it was just bizarre, but I think that's why, and that, that maybe leads to genuine conspiracy theories, where within hours of the result being called, there was people saying, ah, there was vote boxes, ballot boxes swapped at the SEC and all this, absolute, total bollocks, it didn't happen. You know, there was maybe a paper fell out of a ballot box somewhere and somebody's picked up and put it in a bin, and that's, you know, the whole vote's um, mm. wrong. And it's no wonder because up here, if your bubble is 100% nationalist, Republican, anti-monarchy, anti-English, anti-British and cuddly to Europe, then you, of course you think that's what everybody uh, believes. And, and I think that's why Scotland is such a horrific place to live right now. And I've got a cousin who was very, and by the way, he's still my friend on Facebook because he's quite normal. He's just as different political, mm. Um, mm. religious, political, mm. football, mm. you name it. He's at one side, I'm at the other side. Mm. But still cousins. Yeah. yeah. I've got other cousins that I'm 
would probably tell folk they're not my cousin anymore. But Dar <laughs> Darren's all right. But Darren was actually very. Uh, he was involved in a lot of the demonstrations and stuff that were going on in George Square, mm. um, the Yes campaign. Very active. And in the morning of that result, I thought, yeah, beauty, we could stop this nonsense now. And I actually wrote a blog type post on social media and named Dan. And I said, see people like him who want the best for Scotland. I really hope you're involved in what goes next. Because as a Scottish people, if we can just accept what happened last night, now it means we just, we've got to deal with this this book of rules, this devolved power, and get together and actually deal with this book of powers and work out how best we can utilise that to make Scotland a better place, we could be wonderful in 10 years. How wrong was I? Because what happened up here was, not all of them, granted, but the cult, and I have no, I make no apology for calling them the cult, and I'll explain why in a minute. The cult within the, the independence movement and within the, social, the SNP um, bubble, they just will not accept that. And we've spent 10 years now not accepting that. Now, if you cannot accept that, you cannot move forward. Is it any wonder Scotland is probably the worst place in the UK to live just now, apart from probably small pockets in, you know, in, in England, Wales, or Northern Ireland? Mm -hmm. Because we've got this body of people that the only thing that's important is, in, and it's independence at all costs, by the way, but if 10 years ago we had woke up that morning and went, right, okay, we've got them, and to a certain extent, if Westminster had dealt with Brexit the same way, right, we just need to deal with it, regardless if I voted that way or that way, we're in here now together, and this is a book of rules, let's get on with and govern our country. Scotland could be, I'm not saying it'd be great again, but by damn sight better than it is just now. And um, other problem I have with the SNP, it's probably fair to say as a phenomenon when some parties get power for far too long. They've now had, what, 16, 17 years at it. The Tories have had X amount of years at Westminster at it. But it's that's just... A, a, in Scotland, it's a new thing because this is the SNP's first go at the gig, right? And they become complacent. And you bet your bottom dollar, see the first four or five years in power, it was probably their best four or five years because everything was new. Mm. And we've got this opportunity, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and let's make it. Da, 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 da. But then, see, by term two and term three, and blah, 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 the complacency kicks in. And you end up with this almost one party state up here yes, yes. that believe they can rewrite. And we're seeing that's playing out in the COVID um, inquiry right now. Mm. And again, you know, you take that out, let's look at Westminster. So we're going through a cycle with Tory now where they've probably just had power for too long. But before that, we can always remember that Labour. That probably had power for too long. And then fast forward a bit, wee bit further back with that with Thatcher Major, etc. Mm -hmm. And he probably had power too mm -hmm. long. So it's just a cycle. Um, and we need to break that cycle here. And I think as you know, Americans have got this rule where you can only do two terms as a as a president. Imagine having a similar where you could only do two terms as a party. I, I think uh, I think that is a, a wonderful, a wonderful suggestion. But the other thing is, is that we've got to look at the quality of people that are running. And Craig, I mean, I'll say this. To me, you you are a perfect candidate for that. For what? Big running politically. No, thank you. <laughs> but I understand why you say no. Mm. But, the, but the thing is, it's not about brown nosing. What I'm saying is, is that people have life experience. Mm. And it's what they then bring. In other words, someone comes into your surgery as a politician and you are able to relate where they're at. Yeah. Say, I'm going to do that. But see, it's, it's another thing, right? If you take Tory and, and uh, Labour, mm. traditional parties, been about for hundreds of years, and you take SNP, who have been a party for, what, maybe 50, 60 years now, but relatively new in terms of power, how can you expect them to have a skill base and a bank of people to do a job as a politician when we're trying to fill two parliaments? Well, but, that's interesting. I mean, to be honest, it doesn't matter how long the party's been there. Yeah. I still, I just think it's full of appalling people that don't know don't know how to do the job. And e.g., you. It, it is about life experience and what you then bring in there. If you are then going to go to university doing 
philosophy, politics or economics come out there and be a bag carrier for a politician and then you're working your way up in, uh, into the party and because the particular person's bag you're carrying is very influential within that party, then they're turning around and saying, oh, there's an opportunity for you to uh, take this position. A ble- I mean, slightly different, slightly different direction, but it, in, a, in a way it just it illustrates something. I mean, this whole thing of centralization, I mean, David Cameron, when he came in, I mean, the reason why they voted for him is because he could give a speech without notes, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, David Davis, uh, even though he's voting on certain issues is questionable, but, you know, he should have won that. I wanted him to win it. And the reason why is because he comes from a working class background, believe me or not, brought up by a single mother on a council estate. Done well. Lee Anderson. You know, this kind of person to come through because we can relate to them. In the past, it'd be people that run businesses and all and all the rest. E.g., with your experience at Rangers, the reason why people have you wanted certain people to come on the board because they're bringing life experience, they're bringing the skills that you then need. What Cameron did was to centralise the choice of members of parliament. And that phrase came about about parachuting people in into particular areas. So they then, as as candidates, were parachuted in. They had no idea what the area was about. They had no roots with it whatsoever. And that is really, really important because you've centralised that. You can then argue that with the media and everything. You've centralised everything back into London. And... And of that, there is no doubt. And then, and then you find that uh, within what we call the Islington set in North London, a bunch of champagne socialists. Yes, that's a bit of a generalisation for that part of London, but it's true. And then you see, you see that actually the blurred lines between between uh, between parties. And someone, someone, uh, I just say that someone uh, wrote something that was very, very important. The difference between people that say, the whole Brexit debate showed this, people that say that they come from somewhere and people that say they come from anywhere. In other words, that the group of people that believe in nations, they passionately believe in their nation. I am, you know, if we take Scotland, I think it's a third of, just under a third of the land mass of the whole of the UK and has got 500, five and a half uh, million people living in it out of a population, what was it, 68 to 70 million? Yeah, yeah about we, 9% of the population with yeah, a yeah. third of the land. That's, that's right. And, and, and it's how we, you, you've made a brilliant point when you've turned around and said the last 10 years have been, I mean, we're fighting over Brexit and all the rest, has been fighting to keep that vote happening. In other words, as you said, we don't want to see... It did call such division up here. Brexit called such division across the UK. But do we live in a democracy, which is questionable, or do we not? And if we go back to Ted Heath taking us into the common market without a vote, said, I'm going to do that. Well, he would say that because he was Jean Monnet, who was one of the architects of uh, main architect of the EU, who used to have a seat on the uh, on the League of Nations with another top, uh, with a British civil servant. And these are all relevant because it's about global bodies and moving, this is not conspiracy, moving towards a one world government control. So then what you want to do is also make sure that people at times are quite pissed off by the democratic process. So it means, oh, we won't vote. And the powers that be are turning around, they're going, good. Then we have to rewrite the definition of democracy. Do you want to, oh, you don't want to participate. We'll do it for you. (laughs) We'll do it for you. And we all know where that can go. Because you see, I mean, America, America can have many, many criticisms, which, you know, I mean, I, lo- I love the country. I have many, many friends over there in a variety of different states and have regularly been over. 
But the thing, the attitude at times, which I love, which is different, which is this whole thing of get up and go and make things happen. And actually the fact that people want to stand there and clap you and cheer you on. Now that's why there is a, there is a fight there because as we've seen this whole thing of statism, where we've seen a lot, uh, you know, not all young people are like this, not at all. I know somebody definitely are, but this whole thing of, well, I just want it to be given to me. I want what you've got. In fact, no, I don't want one you've got. I want what you have. I'll have that. Well, why don't you go and work for it? Oh, it's easy for you. Really? Really? Go, you know, how do we empower people to, to make that happen? Well, you know, this is something taking back to basics. I had a conversation. I'm trying to remember who it was with. And it was about, oh, I know it was. It was, it was another, it was an English friend of mine who worked with um, asylum seekers. And there's, I think you can divide the whole immigration into a couple of different sections. You've got people who come to this country because we have a genuine shortage of some labour. Now, let's say it was care. I, I get that. So, you, you know, that makes sense. We've got a shortage of people in the care sector. We need to do that. Then you've got people who are asylum seekers for many reasons. And with the kids football team that I've um, run I see a lot of people coming in through that and some of the great examples of that are maybe an Afghani who was an interpreter for the British Armed Forces mm -hmm. helped our guys when they were over there we've left can I leave them there we bring them over to the country that makes sense to me but then you get this other block that, that seems to be the one that most people don't like right and that's the ones that just come here because they fancy it right and what was my point where was I going with that but that, you know and you just question things like that and you're, you're a racist. And you're like, no, no, I'm just a guy. And we had, we had, so we're having this conversation, and he obviously has a slightly different eyes on it, but we're still able to talk, communicate, and not fall out. And what I was saying to him was, why don't we just go into schools? And you, you, your teaching background, you might have a bit of empathy for this idea. And why don't we go into schools saying, right, as a nation, these are the skill shortages we've got. Hmm whatever they may be. Now, if it's agriculture, picking up bloody strawberries or any of these things, care, social care, you know, uh, NHS, armed force, whatever it is these shortages are that you're suggesting we need to bring people in, then start them in the 14 and just say, see right now, let's just do it. Let's just go into schools and sell people the benefits of taking responsibility, not relying on welfare, you know, and all the, you know, the nuclear family, God mm. forbid, is that mm. such a bad thing to maybe sit down and tell children? <clears throat> Do you know it would be a really good thing? Mm. If mummy, daddy and 2.2 kids, mm. that'd be quite a good and a nice thing. You've got the knock-on effects, the health, crime, all these things, right? And does, does that not make more sense than having a big argument about Rwanda? No. Rwanda might or might not be a good idea, right? But the, the, the parliament right now is just to a halt because of this thing that might might not be needed. That discussion might be needed. But what I'm saying is, when do we have, and I think I know why, if you are a politician that is on a four-year contract, basically, because that's all you've got, and then once you get to the end of that, you might get another one, so you're only worried about four years at a time. Absolutely. Do you actually care about some kid that's 12-year-old just getting into the high school system and what potentially might happen to them? Because by that time, it's 20 years, and you ain't a politician anymore. So, so are you? So are you then investing in the long-term interest of the country? Well, I think that's what we should do, and we should expect our, our politicians to do. But when you actually think about it, a politician's only interested in that four or five-year window yes, I, I, because they, they, they talk shite to get in, mm. and then they've just got to make sure they talk enough shite, and they normally do that in the last 12 months. The bit in the middle is just... In bollocks, you, you know, you might get a good year at them, then the bit in the middle of the two, three years where they don't care, and then, oh, Christ, there's an election coming. And suddenly last night we're going, oh, Tory party, we might change our leader. Well, you voted them in not that long ago. The only reason you want to vote them out now is you're considering your seat in uh, your next wee four uh, years. Actually, we didn't vote him in. We didn't so, vote. No, I'm talking about the parliament. Yeah. The, the members of parliament voted yeah. him in. Well, so, they, you know, they decided as a Tory party well, the, the, to vote him. The 19, the nine. well, as far as I'm concerned, there's a coup. Whatever people think of Boris Johnson, he 
there was an election. He was elected Correct. in 2019 yep. and he was elected on get Brexit done. The fact that we haven't got it done. Yeah. Right. And then, and this goes back to conspiracy globalization. So then, um, you then have him, he, he's being advised by uh, Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is a very interesting, uh, interesting character. But Dominic Cummings really wanted to take on the civil service. And then you've got what they're calling the blob come against anyone with independent ideas that actually wants to do, uh, you know, there are certain things I disagree with Cummings on. But Brexit, brilliant. We think we are taking control of our nation, our borders. And I will say this without too much flippancy, even though, all right, I'm glad it's being done. But it's interesting that we can bomb the Houthis, but we can't put the British Navy in the channel. Now, that may be because we don't want to upset all the people that give money to the RNLI. Now, I'm very appreciative to the RNLI, but I don't want to see them doing what they're doing. We need, you know, it's just, just stop this. But you are right, because in the end, what's happening is that people, when we're paying people to be unemployed, and there are jobs that they could be doing. There was a horrific, and I will need to dig deeper into mm. it, but I believe the word of the source, they were man enough to come out and say it publicly, so I don't have any issue with them. Mm. Mm. That 20% of adults in Scotland have never worked in their life. Look, that is fucking frightening. It One is. in five adults in Scotland, or sorry, but it was, it was, I think it was under 30. It mm. may have been, it might have been a wee bit in the brackets with that. But even so, that means, you now I thought it was bad in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. Right? When I was coming out and trying to make a living for myself mm. and, 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 and carve a career for myself, and, I, and, you know, there was people I went to school with that I could see quite evidently just didn't want to work. But it was never that high. And it, and it doesn't matter what age of the demographic it is, that that's a figure. 20%. That's, that's because we've created that. You know, we, we, we've, we, as, as, and when, when you look at it now, and especially the SNP, they, they make me laugh about the amount of free things. The only thing you get free in the whole world is fresh air, and that's only because nobody's figured out how to tax you on it. But but what happens is is that they get your vote, and well, if you if you look at uh, the parallels are, you look at what's happening on the border in Texas in America, and literally these invasion, and the and they end up a lot of those people will end up voting. Demo, for Democrats. I mean, the history of migration in regard to America since Reagan and a constant invasion coming over the Mexican border is a long story. But you then turn around and go, right, 20% is outrageous. It, it's sad. And that needs to, because, and mental health, men's mental health is important to me. It's an important yeah. issue for you. And it's important. Um, that's why, is it, I mean, I, I'm not just saying it for the sake of it. That's why any any opportunity that I get given to on a on a platform to do an interview, to do a speak, to speak is a real honour because it also does my mental health the world of good. Because you're right, we have to discuss these things. Have to be able to sit down to learn to say, you may disagree with me, and you have a right to that opinion. I have a right to my opinion, but at least we can actually sit down and have discourse without shouting and screaming at each other. And to be able to discuss the fact that we have an immigration problem that we need to sort out and that needs to be done, but it doesn't seem as though people want it to be done. This is a huge issue. And then when people discover that we signed what's called the Global Migration Compact, we signed that under Theresa May. And I remember writing a letter saying, and how will this affect us? Oh, there'll be no effect whatsoever. Well, the other thing is, and people do say this, and they're quite right to say this, if we go around invading certain countries, if we go around bombing certain countries, if we go around taking certain leaders out, then there is going to be consequences of that. So, and I know 
uh, I say it respectfully here. But if you then take out Gaddafi of Libya, who then says, if you get rid of me, then what is going to happen? There's going to be mass migration from North Africa. Yeah. What do what are we doing in the in these countries? If we have spent since nineteen seventy, early seventy seventy four, with with the IMF, with the World Bank, handing out loans to third world countries that can't afford to pay them back and getting them into debt, this is all deliberate. There's a fantastic book uh, called The Economic Hitman by John Perkins. I don't say any of these to be clever. The reason why whoever is listening would be great. Go and buy the book, read it, because it is about it is about education, and that. And I, I sorry, I just wanted to uh, finish a thought on the EU. That's why it's important. When Heath took us in in seventy three, we then had a in nineteen seventy five. We then had a vote, um, a referendum, whether we should come in or out. And what's fascinating then is that you would have only had three, three sort of television or a couple of television channels, BBC, ITV, maybe not, yeah, and then a, a few radio channels. But you were then able to, uh, it's this sort of small window of influence. And when you, when you have got someone on Radio 4, a wonderful man then called Jack DiManio, who, um, was anti anti the common market and was verbally saying that on the today show this is all documented um a book uh by jonathan i think uh by aiken forgetting his first name called bbc the noble liar and he he talks about this and then demanio is then um sacked because of what he's doing because the guy in charge of radio at that time was a personal friend of Ted Heath. So you make a phone call. So to affirm you and me in what we're trying to do, this is why independent podcasting, independent shows, communicating, having a discussion and bringing history is important. And here's another one, because it's about ideology. If you then turn around and if you then look at the first Labour Prime Minister of this country, Ramsay MacDonald, I think he came in in 1924. If you then take him and the Labour Party then were looking at, at giving, lending Stalin or giving him between 35 to 50 billion, oh, sorry, million pounds, the, at that time, I hope I've got the figures right, they were on about giving that to Stalin. In 1930. In, 19, in 1930. Now, so well, Ramsey, sorry, within, within Ramsay MacDonald's uh, um, prime ministership, so we, I think it came in 1924, so we, they're on about it then. Now, if you follow that thought, where would that money have gone? Would that money have gone to build uh, more um, gulags where you could lock up incredible people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn? In other, and this is an important point, and it, it all ties in in many ways to what you were saying about the build-up to the independent election of 2014 and whether you're saying the right thing or the wrong thing. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was put, and this is relevant to J6, Alexander Solzhenitsyn found himself in a gulag because he he made some comment about Stalin's moustache in a letter in a letter that went to a friend, and then he ends up in a gulag, and then he writes um, you know gulag archipelago. Then he goes to America and warns them and says, if you do not pay attention, you will lose this. You will go the same way. And frankly, that is what is happening, as far as I'm concerned, because it's totalitarianism. And all of this ties up where people, again, they went on that day to exercise their constitutional rights. And then 1,271 people by now have been, have been arrested, swatted, 
uh, guns with red pointy things pointing at them and their families to come out. Mark, people say, well, what's that got to do with the EU? What's that got to do with where they're at, where we're at now? But look at this cycles politically. And I have to, you know, I want to say it. I have to say it as a Bible-believing Christian, I, th I view this as a spiritual battle. This is a battle between good and evil. I make no apology for that. And that one of the sort of things I do, maybe giftings I've been given, is to look at what is happening politically. Look at how things are manipulated. Because it comes down to this. Scripture in Ephesians 6, it makes it very clear. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. So when you then, as a politically... You then decide, well, we're thinking of loaning Stalin this. We are then, um, at that time, and this is, this is important because it's relevant to Scottish politics. It's relevant to UK politics as a whole. Because you then have got to look at the construct of communism. You've got to look at the construct of the Fabian Society, which is embedded up here. You then got to go in history in regard to people like Robert, Robert Owen, etc. What am I saying? It's an ethos of statism. The Fabian Society would like a communist takeover, but without the revolution. Now, the interesting thing is Tony Blair, whether he's still a, me a member, being a member. Gordon Brown, being a member. There's a long list. Starmer, member. If you look at the list, you can see what what uh, what jobs they then they then held within that are running it. The the badges is a is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I am not saying any of this to be clever. When I wrote in, I wrote a chapter in this book. Right, I'm not. Here's a shameful plug, but called Solutions for the End Times, and I wrote a chapter in here where I talk about our politics. Because what is fascinating then after the Second World War, Churchill, in many ways, called himself, he was a federalist. He believed in the federal states of Europe, but he didn't want us to be part of that. And then suddenly with his son-in-law, I think Duncan Sandy, then attending meetings in the late 40s about creating the, fed the federal states of Europe. So what is going on? What are people's allegiances why did we fight the First World War? How did we come to that? Why did the Americans come in? What about the Federal Reserve? <laughs> this is this is massive. I remember a child as a child being taught about the First World War, and I still really couldn't get my head around how a bullet in Sarajevo, <laughs> an archbishop, <laughs> caused wee Johnny for Paisley being in a trench in France. Absolutely. Right, so th there's something that's just came into my head there as you were talking about America and. Um, getting warned about communism and stuff. And America, obviously, um, 40s, 50s, 60s, very anti-communist, anti-communist. And there was the, I don't know how to best describe it, there was like a witch hunt going around, and it was predominantly in Hollywood. The Mac McCarthy era, the, the McCarthy era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of the people who were, rightly or wrongly, because there was probably a few people pointed out who you know, were, were never communists, it was just, hanging about the wrong pub at the wrong time or something. However, the vast majority of the, the witch hunt was based around Hollywood and, you know, actors and all the the, the, the arts um, in general. And then when we come to the current day, if you know that there's a, a lovey, and I mean that in the nicest personal term, I'm mm. talking about, you know, you're, in your, your line of work, the, you know, the, the arts in general, film, music, drama, anything at all, they tend to have a left bearing. And this obviously back in the McCarthy day, you know, there would have been some truth in it that was how's that a thing? And and how did how does that fit? I mean, is that right? I mean, that might just be my perception that most people involved in the arts tend to be left wing or left or centre. And you're evidently not, yet you are in that that thing, that bubble. One, is my perception correct? And two if that is correct, how did you get there? Your perception is 100% correct. Mm -hmm. And in America, for argument's sake, there are people who are within the arts who are right, what we perceive as right-wing paradigm who will not talk about that. Yeah. But 
a lot, a number of those are coming out to talk about that. Um, how did I get there? Well, uh, that's interesting. I'll just turn around and say that's that's been part of the, that's God given, that's part of the journey. Um, and I, I'd i also say that, uh, no, you've lost, you've lost employment because of your beliefs. Are you talking personally here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Right. So there will be people within the industry who have similar political um, beliefs as yourself. So the choice is shut up or ship out. Is that basically where we're at? That is, in, that is an interesting concept. You could say that. Um, but the other thing is, is that if you're, if you work hard to be good at what you do and do that, then you hope that people would employ you on your merit. Um, but the re the reason, of course, as you know, say within Hollywood, within films, etc., propaganda, then you, you are then able to get an ethos over, you're then able to push your views. That's, you know, within the media is getting your views over. So politically, if you are on the left, then that is what you are then going to perceive. And there has been a work to do that and undermine everything, you know, that it, that is that is good for society. So if you then politically, <clears throat> right, so JFK is then shot. Lyndon B. B. Johnson brings in uh, a new deal, brings in this whole thing of beginning of state independence. And then you will find up to that, you can argue that one of the reasons why the Republican Party was started was to help to get black candidates into, into uh, positions of political power in America. Um, for argument's sake, the National Rifle Association was started to empower black Americans to uh, protect themselves from the KKK. That is not public. Those things are not publicly talked about that there are a number of, of politicians in the past who are of right wing, who, who, are, who are black. Then when you go up to Lyndon B. Johnson, you create then a state dependency. I mean, Lyndon B. Johnson was profoundly racist to then buy, buy votes. And then if you look back in regard to marriage, how marriages broke up, single parent, you are then pushing all of those, all of those ideals. Um, but how, yeah, how I have navigated that so far, that, that is, uh, that is interesting. And I suppose in the end, I mean, I have a very dear friend of mine who, yeah, he's lost his career because of his viewpoint, because he is conservative. Now this is wrong. I mean, there's another dear friend of mine in the industry who is conservative. Um, it's wrong, but that's how it is. And do you think the the realism of it is it might be a 50-50 split? It's just that 49% of those people keep their mouth shut? Or is it a, an industry that is predominantly left-sided? I think, it, I mean, it has been a, of a left-wing persuasion, but there are there are a lot more people who are moving, well, definitely from a cons, what we would call conspiracy theories, definitely there. And it's very interesting because then then they can jump jump from there politically. I mean, it's also full of a bunch of Remainers. I mean, I, I've heard, I've, I mean, there are a number of people that, of course, they think the same, same way as myself. And then when the Brexit vote came in, you know, and people were on set, there was all these youngsters in tears and all the rest because they thought they couldn't go to Europe anymore or something. I mean, it's <laughs> can't just, go to Spain. Like, uh, that's uh, I mean, it's just... Completely and utterly bonkers yeah. because the passport, all we're going to do is change the color of our passport from mauve to blue, get rid of the EU passport, have our blue passport, hallelujah, and say, well, this is our country. But I mean, I'll just say this. I love, I love Europe. I adore Europe, but I do not like European governance. Yeah. I mean, again, when I was at school, the, um, the, the union of trade amongst Europe, Seem to be when I mean, you discuss that in modern studies and we covered it as a topic. You went, that makes sense. Hmm. But the concept of a European Union, the EU, and a trade union is two totally different things. And I think it was sold. Now I was only born in seventy three, so obviously I'm 
going on um, history rather than living it. But I think it was sold on the, to the public as this is just a trading thing. Yes. To make trading easier and Christ look where we ended up. Uh, absolutely. That, other, that is what, that is how, sorry, that is how it was sold. Mm -hmm. um, and the awful situation at that time in regard to our fishing industry. And Ted Heath was told and said, this will wreck our fishing industry. And he goes, how many people in the fishing industry? Something like 18,000, I think, was a figure he was told. That basically, that doesn't matter. We we'll dismiss that. I mean, we, you know, but dismissing that for the the fishing villages up and down the country, maybe there was more involved. This is how, this is wrong. But you are absolutely right. It was sold for that. But the whole idea from the from this was to create a supranational government. When you at the end of the Second World War, we then combined the French and German steel industry. Because after the uh, after the the First World War led to the League of Nations, yeah. and as Richard North and Christopher Booker have written about the Battle of Verdun and the amount of of shells that were fired, you know, from one side to the other, whether that's eight hundred and fifty thousand shells each or whatever. I mean, it's a, a, all appalling, and the amount of death. And I lost a great uncle in the First World War as well, and you. You quite you said a fascinating comment, which was, you know, how does little Johnny from Paisley fit into this? I'm really sad that little Johnny's even had to fit into that. Because when we begin to understand why this has come about and the fact that um we look at the towns and, and little villages up and down up and down the UK who then formed regiments to go off and think we're gonna be back in a few weeks' time. Oh my goodness me. You know. Yeah, there was um there's a time in my life that I lived now in Camus Lang, which is just the outskirts of Glasgow, and the place I was living in, Camus Lang, was the outskirts of Camus Lang. And I took a walk up um, in the direction of East Cobrides, country roads that go up there. Just for a wonder, I can't remember even if I had a dog, I was just doing it. And it's just sometimes in your life, something happens and you think, oh, dearie me, and it, and it just gets you. And there was a monument I stumbled on. And I was like, why is there a monument here? And as you looked, towards Canvas Lang and Glasgow in the background, you could see as far as you could see in a, in a, in a good day, the, the top of Ben Lomond. So you've got a beautiful view, if you can imagine. You're, you're right the full length of Glasgow in 26 miles away, you can see this hill. And this was where the, the, the boys had their last sight of Glasgow on the way to France. Wow. And someone had decided to build a monument there. And it just... You know, you, you, you hear all the stories and we all take information in and differently, we all learn differently. And sometimes it just takes a moment like that, boom. And you go, shit, it's a real thing. It wasn't a sting in a textbook. And I've got a great love and a passion for observing uh, war memorials. If I'm, you know, Southport or Birmingham or wherever, and I see a, a war memorial, always going to show a bit of interest and obviously a bit of respect to be paid there. But enjoy just having a look. Enjoy, that's a terrible problem to use talking about what I am. But, you know, I, 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 I get comfort out of it. And um, just and one of the most beautiful was down, at least just south of Blackpool. I can't remember the name of it. And it was like the bloody Art the Triumph in this small town, right? And, you know, and you, to, but to me before it was just a story. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then that one day when I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s, that small monument four foot up with that view, it was probably two miles away from the train station as these boys were getting flooded down in droves from the outlying mining villages down into the the, the, um, the Newton train station to go to war. Mm. He just felt this bang, well, this is real. And to think then that that started because an archbishop got shot in Sarajevo, it's just completely bonkers. But you know, uh, yeah. And 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 it is, um, and it's quite moving to it's quite moving to hear that. I mean, I remember when, uh, so my great uncle uh, died, just as he had turned twenty. He was a captain, and uh, a few a couple of years ago, I was on a job, and in this kitchen, we were uh, working, and I was working in the props department as a charge hand. So we were taking out this kitchen that we're going to we were buying to use for, on the set in the studio. 
And um, I then discovered that this guy researches people that died in first, first World War. And I gave him my uncle's name and he immediately came up. And I, I welled up. I just went, wow. And, and it buried in the cemetery. But the reason why is because they said he had died, it looks like because of what he had breathed in. So that looks like bronchial problems. So that must have been gas, you know. Yeah. And what you've just said is an amazing story. There's part of me as a filmmaker just think would be amazing to, as if take a group of people and then they morph into military uniform and then march to the local station. And to say they're going on this adventure, but we look at now we know, we look retrospectively with what they went through, just absolutely horrendous. But it's ge geopolitics. Uh, there was. This is something that has affected me since COVID. I used to be quite, quite good at chronolo chronological order and be able to say six months ago, six years ago. Mm. Now okay, I've just lost it, right? Mm. So I'm saying it was probably three or four years ago. It could have been 10. But one of the run-ups to um, Remembrance Day, the was actors get put out in all the cities and, and across um, the country dressed in World War. It may have been the centenary, actually. It may have been, may have been 2018. That would make sense. And it was just, wow. And they just had them standing, solemn. Yeah. In city yeah. centres and mm. towns and villages across. Mm. People going about their normal day. And that's just this vision of these guys. And you think, there's a story behind everyone. And when you, when you say, and I've not been fortunate enough to do it, something I would maybe would like to do one day is visiting these um, graveyards and pay, pay respect to the, the, the kids that died. But when you stand and you see photographs of these endless seas of, of gravestones, everyone had a story. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm immediately, there's a huge memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. for Vietnam. I mean, the Americans lost, I think it's 52,000. And it's, it's getting your head around that and why. And then the uncomfortable thing of why did this happen? And actually thinking this loss of life, it was not not necessary. But there is a there is a tie up. There is a tie up, and in regard to modern day, which is not comfortable, but it's a huge subject, passionate subject that I have. If we look at you, you had the German pharmaceutical industry creating gas, mustard gas, etc., and using and using that. And then 1925, IG Fairbairn, which was a pharmaceutical conglomerate which came together, which was the industrial power base behind Hitler. Dermot Jeffries, and I'll give another book reference, Dermot Jeffries wrote a book called Hell's Cartel, which he then explains about IG Fairbairn, we'll come on to this, because it's relevant. Um, and it's not, you know, not comfortable in certain circles because it involves the, the name, you know, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. So IG Fairbairn comes together to protect its industry. After the First World War, they were very, very concerned about the communists taking over. And there were... Um, there were some uh, destruction of some of their factories. We, as as the uh, as the Allied forces, to some extent, allowed certain aspects of that to happen because we were a bit a bit peed off with the Kaiser for fairly obvious reason. Um, then Carl Duisberg, who was the head of Bayer at that time, then was heading up IG Fairbairn. Now IG Fairbairn, in relation to then to the uh, Second World War. Then, if you think about mustard gas, they then created Cyclone B that was put in gas chambers that exterminated 6 million Jewish people. Now, I, one of the most harrowing um, things of my life I did was to visit Auschwitz in Poland in 1986 and to stand in a gas chamber. Now, Cyclone B over... They created this, the, ph the, the pharmaceutical industry created this. Then 
those industrialists, some of those then found themselves in the dock in regard to Nuremberg and the Nuremberg trials, when we're saying never, never again, we, we cannot have, um, you know, this kind of unspeakable uh, actions by, by uh, the ideology of Nazism and the, 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 the way that the we hate the Jews trope actually turned into a physical action of exterminating six million people. And now we then face people that have Holocaust denial and denial that any of that happened. But this whole thing of the pharmaceutical industry and the, and the power and then what soldiers went through in regard to the First World War, Second World War, but how the pharmaceutical industry then acted in regard to then creating cyclone B to gas and kill people. Plus there's all the experiments, Mengele and all of that. All of that is then recorded. It's all part of, it's all part of that. And it seems as that lovely quote that says, you know, history is written by the victors, Mr. President. Well, Hitler, history may be, but that's why I'm quoting books. It's really important. I encourage anyone to build a library, to build a library, get the information, sit down and learn to read again. And don't, as much as having it on your iPad, to, you know, like a Kindle is fantastic. It's a really cheap way to get the books. But the problem is digitally, everything can be turned off. And that if you physically got a book, you have physically got the information. I mean, I... A dear friend gave me a first edition copy of H.G. Wells' book, you know, and all this kind of stuff. You've then got other other books that look at when we go back to Ramsey MacDonald and the Fabian Society and the Webbs who were so thinking Russia is wonderful. And these people then created the London School of Economics. <laughs> they then write. And this is, and when you say about the ideology, when you're talking about the ideology in Hollywood, you're talking about the ideology within the public, how you're actually programming people. So I, you know, like now when I look at colleges and universities, um, I see them as Marxist training camps of an ideology. And I, on a personal level, I would love to be able to go into universities and have, have, debates i may not be very welcome because they turn around and say you've got these views which i'm entitled to yeah th th this is another thing that uh, you, again it's um, when you talk about america america is generally maybe five ten years up in front of us and a lot of things and because of the size of it a lot of things are amplified but when you see the resistance in campuses in america which are basically cities, let's face it, they're not like Glasgow University that's maybe a square mile, these things are towns. The total resistance to any thinking that's not entirely woke is just frightening. It, it's, it, it's, 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 yeah. I, 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 I like looking at things common sense and logic, mm. right? Mm. Now, if we say, we take America, for example, and it's a two-party state, a two-party um, political system, it must be around about half people are blue and half people are red. Because sometimes, you know, you get a few floating voters. So sometimes the red party get a bit of control and then you get a few years with the, the blue parties, right? So using common sense and logic tells me that about half of America must be red and half must be blue, right? So how come the press, the education system, Hollywood, blah, blah, you know, and the arts are all left bearing when it's impossible because the country must be about 50-50 or the process wouldn't work. You raise a brilliant point because when you take the Frankfurt School that was in Germany and then goes over to America and it has a left-wing ideology, in other words, what I'm saying, and we've raised it over here, we have then the Marxist ideology of any ism has then begun to embed itself within the education system over time, over here, within our within our civil, civil service system, with every single institution. There has been a march through the through the institution. I'll give you a, another his, historical bit trying to answer that. When uh, in regard to China, in regard to Mao, 
America was supporting, I have to get the name right, Sun Chai Chek at that time. Uh, Webb wrote a book from the John Burr Society of called What Have We Done? Which is how they then let down Sun Chai Chek. I think that's how Taiwan came about. And then they backed Mao because there was a left-wing ideology that had embedded itself within the State Department. Eisenhower had called that out. There was this, there was this fight. Um, you go back to how the, how the Federal Reserve came about and Woodrow Wilson allowing that, and literally overnight, this central bank. A central bank had been fought against by Lincoln, by Ulysses Grant. People even get shot over these things. And a central bank. And of course, the Fed, Federal Reserve, as much as this is extremely controversial to any of your banker contacts and mine, I've lost them. <laughs> the Federal Reserve is not a public body and it doesn't have any reserves. It just has printing presses. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the more money you print, you devalue the power of that. And you could say now, maybe it's even less, only a few years ago, that the dollar now is only worth three cents to what it was, say, 1900. But you then bring in a Federal Reserve and how you then do it. And Woodrow Wilson was a, was a socialist. Ted, Teddy Roosevelt was, was a socialist. You then look at FDR and creating the United Nations and the, the, one, the meeting that he had with Stalin with Churchill at Yalta, I think, in 1943, and I mention it in the book I've contributed to, I'm, I, please hear me, I'm not some clever historian. I'm trying to learn things, and I ask, I really ask everyone to do that. Yeah. See, uh, something you touched on yourself, and I meant to talk about it at the time, um, I'll take you back. You mentioned you're, you're quite a strong faith Christian. Mm. Is that something that you were brought up with, or is that something that happened to you? Interesting question. Thank you for asking. I wasn't brought. I wasn't brought up with it. I became a Christian when I was eighteen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say God found me. Right. Um, that sort of story of thinking that at sixteen you're on the scrap heap. Um, no, I was not brought up. My gra my gra my uh, my nan, my grandmother committed Christian, but I wasn't. That wasn't rammed down my throat. Um, so I need to ask, what what happened when you were eighteen? Um, I went down this place called church, and I uh, I was I came across this uh, this girl with blonde hair, and, uh, and that was it. And I asked her out. She was a Christian, and I. Up becoming a Christian through that, um, one of the things. But also, I had—I uh, say that with slight humour, but it's true. But I also, I was apprentice cabinet maker, and I was searching. I was definitely—I was searching. And my uh, workshop manager was a committed Christian, Robin, and he, yeah, we—I was just asking. I was asking questions. I mean. It didn't. I have to say to you that my my uh, conversion within my immediate family then didn't exactly go down very well because you know thought I joined some cult or whatever. So, you, how would your family, your parents, and your, know, your brothers or sisters? How would they have described their um, religion at the time or religious beliefs at the time? Uh, they didn't have any, and also what is really ironic is that in regard to baptism, it's like oh we'll let you. Uh, I mean, I had full immersion baptism. They'd say they let you make up your own mind, and then you made up your own mind, and then they didn't like it um, because I, you no, know, I began to find a purpose definitely, and that that has that has been the the center and the driver since since uh, that that time definitely, of course, and and life at times has been extremely challenging, but thank you know. I've got a, a, a few uh, close friends that are, that are highly religious, and um, only one of them, which is a bit strange, I think strange may not be strange, but only one of them, I would say, had a Christian upbringing. The others found Christ, Jesus, mm. later on in life. Mm. Um, and I know 
the modern world can sometimes be challenging for them. Have you ever had any time, before I ask this question, you need to be aware that I'm very envious of people with faith, right? Because I don't have any. And when I say I don't have any, that doesn't mean I don't believe in God. Mm. That, that means I don't have any faith that I want to be a Christian or 100% mm. faith that I want to be an atheist. Mm. I'm somewhere in the middle. Mm. Now, so when I talk to people and I meet people who have got 100% unstilting faith, by the way, in either of those two questions, because I have met people that are 100% atheist, and I must respect their faith. I, actually, I think it takes them more faith than very, to be a Christian. Yeah, very good. Right? Because yeah. to have faith and 100% committed to religion of Christ means that when we die one day, there's something else in it for us. If you're committed 100% to be an atheist, then it's got a full stop at the end. Yeah. So I believe it actually takes more faith to be an atheist than a Christian, perversely enough. However, I'm tr there is a question here somewhere, Mark. From 18 year old up until right now is a long time. Has there any been at any time within that passage of time where you've thought, I backed the right horse here? I love this question and and your honesty. You're absolutely right. I think atheists have got far, it seems as though they've got such incredible faith mm. to actually and you know to go down that line. Yeah. And, and at times that saddens me because I just think, we could just turn that? Man, oh, man, these people yeah. are going to be so on fire. Um, was there any time that I thought I'd back the wrong horse? Yep. No, even though people had, had had told me. I mean, there were certain things I won't go into, but, the, you know, with certain trials of life, and you just think, wow. But no, actually, it's it's uh, certain. There is a purpose, and before anyone says, oh, yeah, it's a crutch, really? I'll tell you something, particularly over the last few years, particularly of the way this is going, which is um, to then isolate, to then persecute, and it's coming. People who, who believe and stand on the Bible and have a strong Christian faith, that persecution is, is here now. Because we're turning around and going, no, we we don't want this. I mean, this Scotland, Scotland particularly has a has a huge Christian heritage. It does. The UK does. It's called the. Uh, it's called uh, you know one of the things. As much as this is unpopular to say, the empire, but we took uh, a number of seas around the world, which is citizenship, commerce, and we took Christianity around the world, and. Um, and under governance and under empire, we also got rid of slavery. So we just throw that one out there as well um, and use the British Navy to do that. No, there was no, there's no time. I'm not saying, Craig, I'm not saying that at times it is not challenging. And I'll say this, that in, in many ways for me, at times I felt more comfortable in the workplace as a Christian than I have done in many churches. And, that, and there is an answer to that, because we are called to be in the world, not to be called of the world, we have to live in it, but we're called to be in the world. Our job is to go out there and evangelize and make disciples. How we do that, and we use different tools to do that, is, is important, because you and I have had a, so far, incredible discussion and politically geopolitics looking at cons you know touching on conspiracy which is not conspiracy is true and i look at that and i go through history and i look at that because i see the march towards how how scripture is unfolding and if if the book of revelations talks about you know not being able to barter without the number of the beast a, a one world government system the antichrist a system and okay, people go, oh, no, that's nuts. We're going to be here for years and years and years. I don't necessarily believe that because if we look at a convergence of what's going on now in a way that I think it never has done. If we look at AI, we, we want a digital currency, et cetera, et cetera, control. Has there been doubts at times? Of course there has but you work, you work through that. And, you know, and I really appreciate what you've said because I remember 
I think I do remember it. I think it was 2014, where someone says to me, "Well, it's okay for you. You have faith," and I and I respect I respect what you're saying. Um, yeah, there's, there's something, and I tell you, I've been, um, I remember I've been, you know, I wasn't brought up in the church, but I was brought up with Christian values. I was brought up in a school where the minister was allowed to visit once so he can mm. talk to you about things. Mm. I was in organisations like the Boys Brigade where you had to go to church and mm. it wasn't a problem and you were, you know, you were taught Christian beliefs. Um, my father was a Freemason and my grandfather before me. And for those people, they only had to answer one question, and that's, do you believe in a God? So they were obviously religious, or you couldn't be in that organisation. Um, and I have a pray sometimes. So I, I do believe that there's something, that, you know, there is a God. God exists. God's not, you know, I don't think that's just a fairy story. And Jesus Christ if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was a real person, I've got a bit of an issue with you, right? That, that's just bonkers. Um, just like if you were to say Muhammad wasn't a real person, of course he was. I mean, was you know, but whether you think they're good or bad is totally different. So the, the, there is, and it's probably, to be fair, the same as I look at, and, and unfairly, if you compare the two, but the way I look at political parties, so I quite like wee bits and some of them, but I don't like one enough to say I'm 100% that. Mm. So I believe, uh, you know, I have a spirituality, um, and I would suggest that's Christian. But then you can go, well, just crit, you'll get that bit of Christian, all these different things. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like to pigeonhole myself in one. And I view my religious beliefs as quite personal. And I find, no disrespect, and again, I have great... <laughs> I have great um, respect for people that can just say, do you know that? That's what I am. I'm that, right? And I'll stand by that. And I'm, you know, I, I was adult and I wasn't a doctor, didn't I, when I was two. I done it as an adult. That's another plus mm -hmm. for me. So that's what I am. Um, but I, 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 what's the alternative? No, the alternative is that a big bang created all this. You with me? Hmm? What do you, how do you atheist? And if you're an atheist, I've heard one atheist say, "Well, and it was a great answer." And I thought you're a politician, and you. The reason I can believe it happened without a god was it was just always here. I thought, that's a mind bender. That's a proper rabbit hole. That one, right? <laughs> right? There was no big end, beginning. There was no end. It's just always been a thing. And I go right, okay. But all those planets, and the thing that just gets me is, and particularly this happened when I was in getting my gallbladder out, and I had to sit and hear a doctor explain to me what a gallbladder done, right? This thing in here that done this purpose, which was quite amazing what this thing, it was basically a pump mm. and a filter all built into one, right? And I'm like, that happened by accident. There's a thing in here it's been beaten before I came out my mother and will be the last thing to move in my body of its free will and I'm meant to accept that that was an accident that was just you know the, the way after a bang that this whole thing and carbon and all that bollocks and I go I can't comprehend that so then that's a, another reason I'm saying that believing whatever your religion to have a religious belief in faith is actually easier paradoxically enough than having none and I'm a shite bag because I'm in the middle. And I'm going, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I do get it. But just know enough to go, well, I'll have that strand of that. You know, if you take religion and you've got all these different religions and then every one of them's got sub-religions and then some of them's even got sub 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 religions and you've got all these choices and you go, I'm just going to get that one. It's a step too far for me. But here's the thing, and you've said it, and I say this respectfully, that when you ask with father, grandfather being a Freemason, they say, oh, yeah, we believe in God. Yeah. Well, what God? Yeah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And no one, you know, you only get to the Father, but through me. That is my belief. I stand on that, and I believe that is the only way. Yeah. Um, as much as that may be uncomfortable to some others. And you're not you're not being a... a a shite bag by saying in 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 the middle. I I totally respect your honesty, 
I love I love that. The the uh, the key is yes, in some ways you could argue it seems easier for an atheist. Actually, as time is going on to actually stand up for our faith and what we believe in and the Judeo Christian culture, no, this is going to get really really tough because in the end we if uh, as the Jewish people have constantly warned, you know, one or said, you know, they they go for the Saturday people first and then they go for the Sunday people. <laughs> and this, this, this... I've got, I've got a really good Jewish friend and I need to use that one when I'm next. Right, I right, speak to him right, as a cracker. But, but that's the truth. The persecution won't, won't stop. It's, it's coming at us. And... Um, and that's why you have to stand up. But do you believe that they're going to get right into this rabbit hole? Is that an issue, an interreligious issue? Or do you believe as a Christian that Satan driving under the auspices of a religion? Yes. I mean, the bottom line is, look, we come back to, we say there is good and there is evil. We are in the spiritual battle. Right? We are in the spiritual battle. Left-wing ideology says... That you are not, that we are not sinful. You are not born, you know, uh, that original sin doesn't exist. What it's saying is it's our environment and all this. And of course, then saying that God doesn't exist. I mean, Karl Marx, you know, who are, has a heck of a lot to answer for, um, the whole thing about him at one point, he came from a Christian family, may even be training as a priest. And then he writes the Communist Manifesto. And as far as I'm concerned, and I agree with uh, Richard Wormbrandt, who who was a Romanian, um, and he was persecuted for his faith by under Ceausescu. He wrote a book called, uh, I think, uh, Tortured for Christ. He was tortured by the uh, communist regime out there. Uh, and as I found out the other day, my friend's grandfather knew him personally what the reason i'm saying this is because of one of one of one of the things that communism hates the left wing hates is because they don't they don't uh, they hate god god does uh, god doesn't exist so we do whatever we can to create any ideology that resists that it's funny i was, I was talking to someone in, in monday night um i was very very fortunate to visit moscow 17, 18, about then. Maybe 19. Anyway, fascinating place. I mean, just nuts, right? And there was one, I went there with a group, and there was one day, um, I made an arse of the timings. I, I forgot my watch and my, my that was at two different things. And I woke up three, four hours before, because I was, one was on British time and one was in their time. And I got up about four hours too early, right? And I went down the stairs and I thought, as everybody and I got told I was four hours early so I did four hours to kill and I went for a walk right and I walk in Moscow run about Russia and everybody's going to the it was one of the most fucking bizarre things I've ever done and I like I, 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 I worked in London uh, for a while and I think everybody should do that once in their life but not for too long and I saw a similar thing but a different feeling where you go into the, the underground system, particularly in London, and try and help somebody. They think they're trying like one particular day I tried to lift a, a lady with a pushchair to help her up the stairs, and the woman screamed as if I was trying to steal a child. <laughs> right. So you know, and this is probably just a yeah. big city syndrome, yeah. right? This is yeah. London, a bit in a bad yeah. place. So Moscow's got that, because Moscow's fucking huge, right? And I was wandering about and I was looking bizarrely. My girlfriend at the time had told me, girlfriend at the time, she's still my girlfriend, uh, they do pineapple bounties. And because of the job I had at the time, I was doing a bit of travelling around about different countries. And I would always ask her, you want any energy free? And the answer was always no. Bizarrely enough, I'm going to Russia, do you want any? And yeah, could you get me some pineapple bounties, right? I thought, well, that's a good idea. I could try and find these pineapple bounties in Russia, in Moscow. So I'm wondering about, first of all, looking for a supermarket. Mm. And second of all, once I found one of them, try to get somebody that doesn't really speak English and somebody that definitely doesn't speak Russian to try and understand I want a pineapple bounty. <laughs> right? Was that, was that, was that, was that, was, it was quite a, a funny uh, situation. God bless Google and pictures on Google eventually that, that ah, right? Anyway, so that, 
And although I was there for a number of days and had lots of dealings with Russian people, that was an hour or two by myself and I was trying, you know, just going about. It gave me a mad feeling. These people are different. And they were like London in, in the subway times 100. And I didn't realise until the day we were going to the, the Kremlin Red Square and whatever, and the guy, the tour guide, we got off the bus away from it and they took us deliberately into a couple of the underground stations because these are just amazing. These are like museum stroke art galleries in itself. The underground st stations in Moscow are the best underground stations in the world, right, if you want to look up. Anyway, got off the bus, da da da, and he went, anybody recognise that building there? And I'm thinking, I've seen that in a movie or two. That's a KGB head office, right? And you're like, shit. Then I went, hold on a minute. That's why they're, or is it, they're London times 100? Because they have got generation upon generation upon generation that were scared to converse with each other. They were scared to talk to each other because they knew that there was so many KGB agents could be living next door to them, they could be one who they didn't know who the next one was, and they were, they were going through generations of people disappearing in the night because they said Stalin had a funny moustache. And is that what's made these people different, or are they just different? Well, we've, we've found that out through COVID, haven't we, where you were shopping your neighbour if you saw your neighbour out in the garden too long and all this kind of thing. Whatever people step back and look at that, I suppose it doesn't help when you've got someone like Susan Mackey on the SAGE advisory board who's a member of the British Communist Party, but we'll just put that out. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm the last short film I produced, The Iris Echo, is a warning about communism. I just started watching that in the car as I was waiting for you to come thank in. You, thank you. And um, it's not a sort of an awful plug, but I, I made that, uh, produced that for a reason. And I've, I've worked in Poland. Um, you're right. You're right. If you look at, you think with Stalin, I think he started building um, gulags from 1917 to, you know, when Khrushchev came in, I think in 1953. So just stopping that. And um, yeah, you were afraid to say the wrong thing. You were then shipped off as you, as we're referencing. Uh, um, Solzhenitsyn again, just for a moustache, or looking at me in a funny way, you know, is there not the nine o'clock news famous sketch said once, you know, you are right. And what's, what's, what is interesting about that, as, as the war came down in 1989, and then people like in the Stasi in Eastern Europe started going in the buildings trying to find the paperwork to look at, and then they discovered, then they discovered that their neighbours were members of the Stasi, or the neighbours have said this about them. That is that is horrendous. And then we look at the digital control that we have and the spying and the censorship. Yeah. And there is that parallel, but no, the Russians are different. It's 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 East. It is very different. It's an incredible, incredible history, et cetera, et cetera. But you're right. If you've lived under totalitarianism, it's a bit like when Angela Angela Merkel, when Germany was was uh, was reunited, and Angela Merkel then found herself as chancellor. Angela Merkel was brought up in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, according to them, there was no crime. <laughs> so when you are then <coughs> chancellor, you've got a mindset of well there is no crime what's the problem and you're right as in as in the up upbringing i mean what what was her very very interesting to l look at that what was her upbringing family and what were they doing so when they go and discover all these papers and discover that all their neighbors are grassing on them and here it is officially that's not very very comfortable to read no, no. and it was just it was a, just a feeling i got a, a beautiful say majority mm -hmm. of it yes but one of the other, and this is, um, again, it, it's just a, a probably a good example of how socialism isn't really socialism. There was a doctor on the trip, and we were at um, Red Square. Now, I'd only ever seen three sides of Red Square before, because the big long side over there is the Kremlin. Up the top there 
It's a big, lovely church with the domes. And down the bottom, there's another church that doesn't get half the amount because it's just not as pretty as the one at the top, mm. right? Mm. But this side, what you should don't see is um, um, Harrods of Moscow, right? A bit bigger. And I didn't know what it was. But the doctor that was there on the trip had been to Moscow before. And I said, doctor, <laughs> I'm in the toilet. They went, great. He says, oh, it's just used to get away from them. He says, the last time I was here, there's a wee shop round there, and it's like wee arty farty things, and there's a lovely coffee shop. So me and you will bugger off. I'll get you to the toilet, and we can, we'll catch up with them later on and get away and do it, right? So I was like, but where's the nearest toilet? And he's like, ah, the, um, the shop, the, um, what do you call it, uh, apartment store. And I walked in, I have never been in a department store like in my life. And I've been in Dubai and London and Madrid and some lovely cities. And it was opulent and stunning, mm. right? And it, it was like chrome and marble and gold and gilt and Gucci and Fendi and, right? And I went to the toilet. And it was the nicest shite I've ever had, right? <laughs> because of the surroundings. It was just opulence. <laughs> And as we came out, I says to the dog, depending when you were here last, would be depending if that existed at the time. Mm. Is that what you're talking about? And I said, that's there's obviously been built for the oligarchs and the, you know, the new money and the wealth and the senses for the communism. communism. I said, no, that building predates the Tsars. Yeah. And I well, how did it survive? Because I was led to believe that this communism was... Everyone's equal. So you'd imagine that the day that the Tsars stopped being in power, there was no need for that. Don't kid yourself. And then that made me realise that even the, the most communist of communist countries in the world didn't get communism. Because this thing, this opulent palace of, 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 um, of uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, commercialisation, it was from 1918 all the way through. It wasn't um, Abramovich that built this. You with me? So the yeah. Abramoviches must have been in the society all that time, or this palace of commercialism couldn't have existed. So the whole thing's bollocks to me. And when I speak to people that are, you know, socialists, you know, it might surprise you to understand I do have some friends that are socialists <laughs> <laughs> and still friends. Um but I say to them, can you give me one example of where socialism worked? Okay. Because I can give you mm. loads of examples of where the opposite works. Absolutely. Absolutely. So is, it, is socialism a good idea? But it's only a good idea until the money runs out. But the bottom line is, is that we're talking about people's hearts, mm. right? If we get, we come back, if we come back to uh, Christian faith, as you know, follow it. Following Christ is allow is allowing Jesus to to change is changing your heart. So we're all naturally selfish, period. Yeah. And the only person that sort out that is Christ. Now, socialism, communism, no, it doesn't work because man is naturally selfish. And if you go through this, you can see that there is no way it's worked. It's like if you take uh, Venezuela for argument's sake. At one point, Venezuela. An incredible, incredible country, you know, very wealthy and all the rest. Then look at the state of it now. Now with Argentina, it's exactly the same, even though Mille has come in. So it's going to be really, really interesting to watch what's going on there. Um, there are, we go, we go through, we go through this. You have the gulags of Stalin, the thousands of people that were sent there and that died were murdered when you ask when you create um and i've forgotten the canal that they built but they literally said right we need to dig this canal out and they've got all this all this labor all this slave labor doing russians doing this building this and then they scrapped it because it wasn't deep enough <laughs> now another book um incredible book by Giles Udi, um, about um labor and the gulag and f and it going through the labor labor routes that's why i bring that up with ramsey mcdonald it doesn't work these people were fascinated by the ussr 
I mean, there is, Anthony Eden is it's quoted there. He when he uh, when he was with I think Churchill or Yalta, maybe on another occasion, and he met Stalin. They're in awe of this man. This man that would kill his own family. Yeah, and right? that and did. So no, it it doesn't work. Whatever people think about capitalism, capitalism has taken more people out of poverty than any other system. But this is the key rub. It's when people are running companies, whether you look at Cabris, Terry's, etc. Even even though Robert Robert Owen's ethos, I would say, more of a collectivist socialist background. When you look at that, it's down to the individual who's the boss and who they are and how they treat people. If we look at um, you know the whole John Lewis partnership and people being able to in the past having a share of that, it's how you treat your workers, how you share that, and that and this this whole thing of um, of when they when they turn around and go well it's communism communism fascist and. We have got that now because it's called a public-private partnership. The third way, as they neatly call it. You've just been calling this out in regard to, um, not, not this, but I'm just trying to think of what you just called out. But I'll give you an example. So under Blair, you know, pushing for public-private partnership, new hospitals are built. But we are then, as the taxpayer, paying for many, many years for the building of that hospital through the public-private partnership. If it was built publicly then, it would have been maybe a lot cheaper in that situation. So this whole thing of is about the means of production. In communism, it seems very obvious that the state is running it. Within what they would call, you know, a fascist situation, or I'd say if you look under under Nazism, is is the fact that you've got they would then go, oh, look at these capitalists. Well, it was a mixture. These private companies were providing resources for for the Nazis, but they were members of the Nazi Party, and Klaus Schwab's uh, father was one. Let's just put that out: a man that actually moved to Germany to run a to run a factory. And as I say to people, if I've said anything wrong, people could tell us. But the bottom line is, go and do the research yourself. But it's an ide- it's an ideology, and the ideology that leads to genocide, that leads to eugenics. And that's why when, when Webb wrote the book about what we've done in regard to not backing Sunshine Check, we le- then look at what, what, Mao, what Mao then did. And you then, under Mao, you are creating a situation. Let's just bear this in mind. You then starve your people. And you go through a thing, we're going to shoot all these birds. We're going to kill all these birds. Take these birds out. Why, why, are, you, why are you doing that? You are then, it's like Stalin did exactly the same. But Stalin did this where you are not managing your economy properly in regard to food. And as he found out and others found out that once you if you control the food supply, you control the people because people are starving. And it's exactly the same with the whole thing with energy policy. And just for the record, and as you said to me on the phone the other night that made me laugh so much, you know, if they found coal or oil or whatever and Saturn, you know, how did the dinosaurs get there? The, the, which is funny, you know, let's just say this controversial 100, 100 points said, said in this amazing conversation. No, it's not oil, coal, not fossil fuels. You know, I think, um, I, I'm not. I know I have my where my beliefs are on the subject, mm. right? But I've just not learned enough to probably commit to an hour, an hour and a half podcast on it. But I do want to be comfortable enough. I mean, I know where my belief is in the whole thing, the whole debate. But I'm just not com- competent and comfortable enough to sit and maybe do an hour, hour and a half on it. But I think the whole climate change um, that is a conspiracy. Um, needs discussed and i will do that and i'll do it in the future because right. I, it's something that i just when i when the penny dropped to me i thought what was all that shit about well, well i think it'd be fantastic if you do and then if you if you use people like patrick moore who who set up greenpeace yeah. one of the founders of greenpeace 
and then look at what he's saying now as gray as greenpeace moves into an oh. anti an anti-human organization do, do you know one of the ones that got me was, what was his name is it david bellamy yeah disappeared yes and i didn't realize a he had disappeared mm. or b why he disappeared because and it was probably i don't know when it was and i thought where is he what happened to him i thought he was dead he wasn't dead he was just killed off by society because he stood up and said this is actually a load of bollocks yes and we've now got again i don't want to get into this rabbit hole now i want to do it but i want to do it in another situation when i've done more of research on it but we've now got scaremongering and again it's one of these things if you're not a tree hugger you're a bad person oh so you 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 think it's all right if co2 well yeah because since i learned that the atmosphere actually needs co2 and if we had zero co2 we wouldn't survive but this is the thing the, the, the thing that gets me even if there was such a thing as life on earth being in jeopardy how dare we feel we are so superior that that's the end of the world what you could affect and this is a this is a maybe this isn't a definite but if global warming was a thing who wouldn't kill the earth if it was true which i don't believe it is it would not kill the earth the earth would not blow up and stop right the earth would just evolve as it's always evolved and the only thing is that we as our selfish own needs we might not be able to survive on it because the earth's been very very warm and the earth's been very very cold and there's absolutely, only a little absolutely. bit in the middle that we can actually survive in as human beings yeah. so we ain't going to kill the earth and i don't even believe we could do enough to make it too hot yeah. or make it too cold that will affect us not being able to live here I, it's just nature but absolutely and i think you know enough already i mean let's just quickly say this without going down the rabbit hole so what do trees do with co2 they take it in they create oxygen and the more co2 is the more greener they go it's complete and utter you're right it's bollocks and it, and and the thing is it's about tyranny and control and again it's something that the club is the big thing that the club of rome came up with to then lead this into creating a green tyranny. I mean, if you, um, the, uh, again, you know, the books like The Greening of America, et cetera, they've pushed all this. And, and as much as this is not popular to say, there is not an overpopulation problem. And this whole thing of Malthus and pushing all that. And we, we see, need- see, see on that, hmm. anybody that tells you there's not enough space Drive 40 minutes out of Glasgow in any direction. We've got fucking loads of it. Well said. Yeah. Well, well, well said. And in fact, up and down this country. But it doesn't mean that I want us to be building on it. At all. Um, not at all. But this again has been pushed through when you've had people like Obama saying, oh, the science is settled. This is about tyranny and control. The science is the science is that trees take in co2 create oxygen we need oxygen you're absolutely it's fascinating what you've said about david bellamy he and i i think i he went to my school i think i went to the same school um amazing man and i take it after him <laughs> craig you say the worst wonderful things thank you <laughs> yeah i did um brilliant but um but it is it is i mean it's huge i mean especially as we look at the winter that we've been through i've never seen so much rain um that of late which has been deeply frustrating but we see the winter that we've been through and then if people are going well we can't afford to heat our homes and all this kind of thing this is this is rather serious and then it's like no you can't have stoves and oh let, let's just take it the whole thing of electric cars right this is completely bonkers on my way to to you today i'm I actually, oh, there's an electric lorry and then an electric bus. Okay, fine. Well, if we say from here or from where I live, it's about just over 400 miles, 435 miles to drive to London. In my van, I can do that on the full tank and more. You then, the amount of times you've got to charge your Tesla. And, and when you say to these people, that's great. Um, how was your electricity created? Um, maybe through a nuclear power station or a coal-fired power station. And then they turn around and go, 
well, I'm at least my car, I'm not chucking out these fumes, but how is electricity created? And then um, is the fact that we can control you. We ask you to have a smart meter, which means we can see your usage. Oh, it's too much. We'll turn it off. When now you're in your electric car, oh, we'll turn that off or we'll steer you in a certain direction. I, I, I was watching, I wish I'd, you've got a great memory and a thing that I can't do. If I read a book, watch a film or whatever, the information goes in and it stays in. I can't tell you this was the name of that book and that title when I'm regurgitating the, um, the information. It apparently takes about 19 years to see a break-even point on the carbon footprint of an electric car. That is when you take into consideration the destruction to the earth caused by making the thing, the batteries, and every component that goes into it, and the electricity that goes into it. You have to run it for 19 years before you get one ounce of carbon footprint reduction, which is totally bollocks. And I cannot understand why people fell for it. And again, you know, it's what, 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 was the, what was the point? You know, and I think, again, as we spoke about the other night, a conspiracy is only a conspiracy until not enough believe, people believe it's the truth, but it's always been the, tr the truth, right? But somebody somewhere decided we're going to tell this lie, this global-sized lie, and the world fell for it. But I want to ask you just one final question. And I want you to try an answer, one answer, which I think will be impossible for you. <laughs> but out of all the things that you have in your concerned list at the moment for the world, what's the scariest? What's the scariest? Um, what what I see what I see coming down the pipe, which is global tyranny which is global control. Do you and it? do you see it as, a, as an option that could be fulfilled? I think it's coming about, and I will take various exercises for saying this, and then there is so much part of me deep down where you want to resist this as much as you can. And I, I have to, you, you asked me that question, that, that, is, that, is my, that is my huge concern because I've seen how people have been so programmed over the last few years to believe, sorry, but the pandemic, and that's how I see it, and the scam, and the control, and the destruction that that's brought about. Um, I can't hide from that. And then can I answer answer it in a different way as well to say that I then have have responsibility to point to the answer because I turn around and say without faith in Christ you ain't going to get through what's coming and I don't say that lightly I'm not saying that as some huge preacher on the corner bashing people over the head because I care passionately about this and I get very upset when people, when you're trying to point things out very calmly, very gently, and people just think you're raving nuts, and then suddenly, oh my goodness, yeah, yeah, this is this is real, and we are at this we are at this point, and that's why very brave ex footballers like Matt Letizia have been saying what he has done for a long for over the last few years, as an amazing voice to say global tyranny. But I've seen, I've read the books, you see the plan. And the Club of Rome is real. You see, you see it and what's on and what's on the and what's unfolding. And as much as this uh, maybe what gives me hope is that I know that Jesus is returning. That's what gives me incredible hope. Because it's true. I believe that. But I have a response. That's why sitting opposite you now, having an incredible conversation, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for it. And it gets emotional 
And the reason why it gets emotional is because you have the guts to have it. And you have the guts to take a conversation in a direction that may not have gone in before. And I commend you highly for that. Because we're having a conversation, Craig, that is not happening in so many, in many churches up and down this country. It's not happening. And that's why I commend you for it. I'm not just saying that for the sake of it. And just for the record, anyone listening, this was totally unscripted. <laughs> we have gone in so many different directions. And the reason when you say I remember books and stuff, that is what I can do. But I, I use it for a reason. It's really important because it's evidence. And all I, I say to people, I don't ask you to agree with me. Please go and do the research. Come back and let's have an adult conversation. But I have to say that, and I'm grateful and thank you for the platform in which to be able to say that, and then I can back that up. That is my number one concern of what is coming down the line. The number one concern is, is that unless people have faith in Christ, they're not going to get through what's coming. And every single thing that you can imagine tyrannically, et cetera, is is coming it's already it's already to be in place it's as though they're beginning more and more to collapse this country if we look at what's happened in port talbot with the steelworks because they think oh the 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 uh, setup of it it's aging so now we're going to cut this down and make it more sort of uh, climate friendly and all this kind of thing so much so that we are wrecking our economy and being in the situation where we cannot stand up independently to make our own steel. So if we needed ships and armaments, we can't do that, let alone, you know, fridge freezers and all the rest. We'd just be buying and all this stuff from China. And how, what are, they don't care about their carbon footprint. They're building the equivalent of a coal fire station virtually every two weeks. They don't care. Sorry, I'm trying to answer the question. I'll come back to that. <laughs> that, but but it, but in one, I told you. It would be I know, to I get know, one. I know. But I suppose what it what it is 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 because you're then trying to paint a picture of why you say it. That's the whole point. And the wonderful thing about about yourself and getting to know you is that you will provoke thinking. You're asking questions to provoke thinking which I think is, as I've said to you, is an incredible skill to do, and then facilitating that. But that, that, is, that is genuinely my concern. You see, the socialists would turn around and say, well, we're going to build our utopian dream on Earth. And if you don't buy into this utopian dream, socialism always leads to communism. And the problem is, to get out of communism, you have only one option, which is to shoot your way out of it. There is no other way. As in history have said, I, I'm not advocating that, but history have said, and it doesn't work. But it's also the opposite of what Christ is talking about. It's totally the opposite. So you use the word Satan. Yes, They're going to on one side, and then there is this. Then there is this opposition, and that is what we are de dealing with. And any ism, you know, Marxism, communism. Feminism, yes, I said that. Any <laughs> ism, and that's the subject for another day, because as men, we're a little bit fed up with being put down and told that, you know, that uh, masculinity is wrong or aggression is wrong. Well, how did we get here as a society over many, many years? I'm not advocating violence for violence's sake. But, but, and, but this, this is where we're at. That, and I appreciate what you've said, which is I could, it's trying to lay it out to say why I then come to that conclusion. And you very, you wonderfully given me the opportunity to say that because there is only one way and that then makes you immediately unpopular. But this discussion, my friend, Craig, this is not happening in churches up and down up and down this country, and it needs to. That's why I turn around and say I'm more comfortable as a Christian here being able to, being given the platform to say what I'm saying than I am in, in a load of churches because they won't face, they won't face these issues of what, of what is coming because a lot of them have swallowed half of this stuff. They've swallowed the whole climate change mantra and all that. Without being disrespectful, 
mm. to you mm. as a as a as a Christian. Mm. But I can understand why people in churches fall for it because they didn't make the decision as an adult for you as you did and as some of my friends who are some of the most Christian people I know. Mm. Mm. They came into being believers because they were just told to. Mm. So when you when you take something on board as complex as religion and as complex as God and as complex as Jesus Christ and just accept it without question from being that height, then it must be so easy for you to believe that the world's going to explode if we don't use electric cars. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm. Now, to you, that might not make sense because you totally understand in your head, again, I don't mean that disrespectfully, mm. that God is real. Jesus Christ is real. The Gospels are real, mm. right? Mm. But you made that decision as an adult. Mm. If that was indoctrined into you, which is a problem I have with some strains of, especially Christianity, then it is no wonder to me these people are gullible. Now, there's one thing I don't mind about the Protestant religion that I can't get my head around with the Catholic religion, and that is Mary was a virgin. I can't really get that. But I can understand that if you're told that from an early age, but by the time you're 35 and somebody tells you global warming's real, you just go, fair does. Because you're with me. You have a you have a a history of being indoctrined to, whereas you don't. So it doesn't as an outsider, when you walk into a church uh, um environment and you're you're looking at people going, How do you believe that? Well, they didn't make the adult decisions you did about believing in Christianity, Jesus Christ, and God. They just believed it because that's what they were told to believe it. Mm. So I kind of get that. However, what a three years that's been. We've put down on record three hours worth of chat. Now, there was, there was wee bits where I had to go to the toilet. Uh, there was a wee bit where we lost communication with the, with the camera. And I think we hit record probably before we started. So I dare say we have probably got over two hours and probably at least two and a half hours of material. And for that, I, I, I can only thank you. Um, as I say to all my guests, the greatest gift you can give anyone is your time. And you've given me loads of that today, so I can only thank you for that. And uh, before we, we shut the camera off, is there any last words you, you want to say, Mark? I just want to... I just Don't wanna, thank me, by the way, in your I'm last going words. To. I do, I do want to do that. And, and thank everyone for, for listening. And then let's just encourage this uh, discussion. And also to the other discussions that you are encouraging. This is important. I told you that one day you're going to fill a pub and we are going to fill a pub and we're going to have, have this discussion. I think talking is so important at this time. It is so important. And actually physically being in the same room to facilitate that. Um, and that, I just, no, I mean, generally, I just want to th uh, thank you for that, um, for being given this uh, this opportunity. No problem. Well, it was a pleasure having you. And uh, I'm sure it will not be the last time, believe me. So um, there we go, folks. That's the end of a very long podcast, which has been delightful to take part in. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content, hit the subscribe button and the wee notification. However, as I always say, most important thing of all, have a great day. Bye now. Bye now.